Hi, this is Eugenia Mitchell, host of At Home with the Mitchells. Thanks for listening to the following podcast on Public House Media. What's up, guys? Welcome to Your Life Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mariah White, and I am a passionate pediatric nurse practitioner and fired up health and happiness coach here to deliver a message to you. This podcast is meant to provide a hope and a dream that fuels your soul to dream big and to dream bold and to inspire and empower you to live out your wildest freaking dreams and to grab a hold onto the unwavering truth that you were made for more. Well, welcome, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday. I am just on behalf of all of the speakers, just wanting to thank you um, and just so proud and humbled that you guys are joining us, that you decided to get a little uncomfortable this Saturday morning and have a really good talk. Um, I want you to understand that this is a safe place, that this is a place where you can feel safe and comfortable. This is a place where you can ask tough questions, especially when we go into um, the Q&A later on today. Sorry, I put this in speaker view and it doesn't, it's not quite quite working. Um, but I wanted you guys to know that this is a safe place. I wanted you guys to know that this is a place where you can feel loved and accepted and we're going to talk about really tough things. So I encourage you as the facilitator of this call, um, please be respectful of anything that you do ask, especially in the chat. If you start to get uncomfortable or angry or hurt, I ask that you just kind of challenge yourself to push through, stay on until the end of the call. And if there's a reason why you feel like you have to hop off, I empower you to please hop off and then message me privately or one of the speakers privately, because I just wanna keep this a very safe, area. Um, I also want you guys to know that I'll kind of be, when it's to the q and I'll be doing like the raise hands, this, that, and kind of just directing the questions where they need to go, um, just so that everybody feels safe. And I wanted to preface that first and foremost, because I want you all to feel like this is a safe, uncomfortable area for you to be at. So, um, talked about the ground rules, welcomed you guys. Um, First, I want to just go ahead and introduce my amazing counterparts that are speaking. And because she she is sitting next to me, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lee Aziz. So, Lee is a... Um, seven-year community youth mentor, a high school special education teacher with a master's degree in education, retired 11-year professional basketball player, born in New York and currently living in Arizona. So this is Lee, welcome. (laughs) And then I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, one of my dear amazing friends, um, Tori Davis. She is a one-star diamond. She is a social worker pursuing her master's degree. She grew up in a small town in Iowa and she's currently living in Arizona. Next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Alex Watson. She is a two-star qualifying coach, a doctor of pharmacy, full-time clinical pharmacist, part-time coach, born in New York City, and currently living in Arizona. Next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Virginia Scroggins, a 10-star coach, a doctor of pharmacy, full-time coach, originally born in Saskatchewan, Canada, now living in Arizona. And then my dear friend, Daniela, she is an entrepreneur, team beach body coach, mother from Toronto, Canada, currently living there as well. So I just wanted to go ahead and introduce them briefly, and then I am going to kind of let them introduce themselves. But I wanted to start this call with something powerful. I was not going to share this. This was something that was literally a spur of the moment. My dear friend from Canada, Britt Hilko, sent me an amazing thing and tagged me in her stories, and I thought it was very fitting. So I wanted to share it with all of you. So I'm going to take a deep breath because I'm nervous. (laughs) I want all of you to take a deep breath. And I want you to hear my words. Express yourself. Don't walk around with the burden of enough said things, unlived talents, and untold stories. Free yourself and live out loud. You will never regret standing up for yourself or standing up for someone else. We always have the ability to use our light and our words to protect ourselves 
and our neighbors from harm. When we allow hurtful or negative behaviors to pollute the environment around us, we do a disservice to everyone. No one deserves to be bullied, marginalized, or humiliated by others. Standing up for ourselves and others is something we can always be proud of. Do not swallow for darkness to spread because of your silence. Shine the light with your voice and actions instead. And I got chills and I'm so grateful that Britt sent me that and I think that it is only fitting for right now. We need you to stand, we need you to learn, we need you to unlearn, we need you to act, we need you to speak, and I need you right now in this safe place to feel empowered enough to move forward. So on that note, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to my speakers. The very first thing that I want to do is in, have them introduce a little bit about themselves, a little bit of their background, but also I want them to answer one question. When was a time that you either experienced racism or saw racism and share that experience with us all? So Dr. Watson, do you mind going first? Nope, I don't mind. All right, so a little bit about me. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I, gosh, so where do I start? So first of all, like Maria said, I was born in New York. Um, I moved around a lot. My dad wasn't military. He worked for General Motors. We lived in New York. We then moved to Michigan. We then moved to Kentucky. We then moved to a different part of Michigan. We then moved to Virginia. And that's actually where I went to college. And then I now live in Arizona. So I have a lot of experience, pretty much every single grade that I've, every grade school that I've been to, elementary, I was at a different school in a different state, middle school, same thing, high school, same thing, college, same thing. So I literally have been around the block. I've been in multiple different environments. I can't even imagine you people who have lived in the exact same city your whole entire life. Like that's like insane to me. But what is cool is I actually still have friendships from every single school and state that I've lived in. So love that about my story. Um, growing up, my parents are both first generation um, college students. So my parents were able to be exposed to a lot in our industry. They, they're both, they both worked in corporate America and therefore they moved differently. So when I grew up, I always lived in the suburbs and the suburbs have always been predominantly white. So that's what my schools have looked like my entire life. I have grown up being the only black girl in my classes. I've grown up being the only black girl in my honors classes. Um, and I've been one of the very few black girls in every single sports team that I have grown up at. So that was part of my decision. When I did go to college, I got into a lot of schools. I got full ride scholarships to a lot of schools. I was a very, my parents knew since they went to college what it took to get into college. So I was very, very well-rounded. I was in everything, like everything your parents might've pushed you to do, I did because that was my only chance of being able to get into college, much less getting a scholarship to college. So I did get several full rides. Um, I did choose a historically black college and university because my entire life I was surrounded and isolated um, and not being able to be around that many black people. So I chose that school to go to to get my doctorate degree. Um, growing up in sports, I started playing sports four years old, started playing t-ball. Same thing with basketball, played sports my entire life, very good at sports. No matter what school I went to, I was a starter. It didn't matter where I moved, I was good. When I got to college, when I got to my high school, um, I'll tell you guys a, a small story. When I, my first year there, I went to school with Mark Ingram. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of him. Right now, he is a football player. He plays for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, but I went to high school with him. We went to the same high school in Grand Blank, Michigan. Um, and my freshman year when we moved there, so that's my first time at another school. So high school, get there, hearing stuff my freshman year, this black guy who's a year above me, you know, he's, they're not playing him. They're 
putting him in different positions that aren't what he shines at. They're benching him. He's not getting the playing time. His dad is a, is a professional football player. His dad ganks him out of the school, takes him to a school in Flint, which is 30 minutes away. So when you look up Mark Ingram, you're not going to see Grand Blank High School as the high school he went to because by his sophomore year, his dad had had enough, pulled him out and took him to a school that was predominantly black. Mark Ingram went on to get a full ride scholarship to University of Alabama and won the Heisman Trophy at University of Alabama and is now in the NFL. Guarantee you 100% that would not have happened if he had stayed at my high school. So for me, in my high school career, my sports career, um, I didn't play sports my senior year. By my senior year, I had lost love, lost the love of, I'm sorry. I closed the chapter of that part of my life because it was so hurtful. Um, by my senior year, I didn't play any sports. I didn't play basketball. I didn't play softball. It was very clear racism. Um, you know when you're good. You guys know when you play in high school sports who the good players on the team was. There's no question. So when you're put in the position where you're sitting on the bench and you watch your coach put you in, immediately you're scoring like 10, 12, 14 points within less than a quarter and then pulling you out, sitting the bench for the rest of the game. Like, there's a problem, guys. There's a problem when we're behind and, oh, put Alex in. Oh, we're back up. Take Alex back out. That's the type of thing that I was experiencing. So by my senior year, I was done. I said, I'm not trying out for basketball this year. I don't care that I've been varsity since my freshman freaking year of, of, of high school. I'm not playing this year. Softball, I junior year is the year that you prep for ACT, SATs. So I, I started Kaplan courses to prep for my ACT, okay? So that took me having to go to these classes to learn and, and get better test scores. So I was late. I told my coach, you know, I have this class that I take for my ACTs, and it's going to cause me to be late to one of the practices. So I let him know I'm the only Black girl on the entire softball team. I let him know. I go to my softball practice late, and they tell me, actually, they didn't even tell me. The next day was a game. They sat me on the bench. I didn't play that game. The next game, they sat me on the bench. I didn't play that game. The third game was, our, uh, was against our biggest rivals, our biggest rivals. I knew that they needed me. I'm the best first baseman, the person who they replaced me with was someone who had just started softball in high school. You guys know there's a difference between people who travel softball and travel freaking basketball their entire school years, their entire years, versus someone who decides to start a sport in high school. I took my jersey, I took my stuff, and I went to my coach at that game, and I handed him over my stuff and said, I'm quitting. I'm not a quitter. I don't do stuff like that, but I'm not gonna sit in a toxic environment knowing that you're discriminating against me because anybody else who's going to study for ACTs, like what, do you, what are you doing? Like there's no, there's really just no excuse for it, you guys. Like that's just, that's just my experience. So by then, even when I went to college, I wasn't interested in playing sports. Like I was so over sports at that point and it's sad that it got to that point. But when you, when you're someone who has to fight so much harder just to get the opportunities that you've had, you, you don't want to sit in that. You know where you're wanted and where you're not, and you, you choose to move differently. When it comes to, and I'm going to shed light on this, and I hope that someone from corporate is on here, and if not, that someone from cor corporate gets this, but I know how to adjust. I have been amongst white girls and white boys my entire life. So when it comes to Beachbody, it was, it's not that hard for me to matriculate and be amongst my fellow white coaches and friends. I have nothing against white people. Like, I love you guys. I grew up with you guys. Like, I know that a lot of times it's ignorance and you just don't know because you're not in the, you don't have my experience. But I know how to move with you guys. I know how to adjust in situations. And so therefore, 
when my friend Virginia, when I hit her up and I'm like, hey, I think I want to join Beachbody, it was because I knew that I would be fine. I didn't, I didn't necessarily do my research and look at Beachbody, but when I went to my first summit, you can best sure believe that I was uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable. Thank you so much, Alex, for, <clears throat> for sharing that, mm -hmm. for shedding light on such a difficult topic for you personally in your life as you transitioned. And it hurts my heart as, a, per, as an athlete, as a professional athlete, and as an athlete you are, that you gave up a sport due to racism. Um, for those of you listening to this, I ask you to put yourself in her parents' shoes and as a parent, ask yourself how painful it would be um, if your child experienced that. So that's what I want you to take away. And then for my coaches, um, my fellow white Beachbody coaches, we love you. But I want you to understand, and I'll be addressing this later on with my story. I want you to understand, she said it, we can move within Summit. We can move within corporate events. We can move within but we also feel uncomfortable. And I'll just go ahead and say it. I shared uh, this conversation with my dear friend, Sarah Morrison. <clears throat> She's one of my mentors. And she had a very safe conversation with me. And I said, Sarah, when you walk into a room, you don't count how many brunettes are in the room and then segregate to them. You don't count how many people are from Alpena, Michigan and then segregate to them. But I want you to know that every black person walks into the room, eyeballs the room, finds every black person, and I want you to know if there's five black women in a room at a Beachbody event, at some point in time, all black women, all those black women will be in the back of the room introducing themselves and getting to know each other. And then I explained that to her and she said, and I asked, what's the, what's the barrier for you to walk up and introduce yourself? And she's like, well, I, I just wouldn't feel comfortable. I, like I, I, would, I would feel like I'm not wanted. And then I said, and then she said, but if you were back there, of course, I know that you're safe. I want you to think about how that makes everybody feel. Why do you feel uncomfortable walking up to a group of five black women? Because you feel uncomfortable, because you feel unsafe. But we are expected to walk into a room of 450,000 white coaches and feel like we fit. So moving on, <laughs> sorry, um, I wanted to share that. Alex, thank you so much for sharing that. I want you to take that take, take away that I expressed. Um, moving on to Virginia Scroggins. Dr. Scroggins, could you please unmute yourself and share your story and one area of racism you've either experienced or um, yourself or witnessed? Hey guys, um, so that was really hard because Alex is one of my really good friends and it's just, it's hard hearing these stories every single time. So I am from small town Saskatchewan, literally the first town I lived in, there's uh, maybe a thousand people, all white, completely white. Um, moved a couple times throughout my life. And I feel like even moving gave me a little bit more perspective of being the new kid, feeling uncomfortable. Luckily, um, I was able to travel with my family um, to, out of the country to like Cuba and Mexico, go some different places. And every time I went, I loved it. I loved seeing different people, different cultures. And I feel like that experience as a young child led me to the decisions that I made throughout my life. So I'm super thankful that I had that opportunity. Um, so I went, so I played sports all my life and I got a volleyball scholarship to Hampton University, which is the same college that Alex went to. It's a historically black college. I got opportunities and offers at other places, but I wanted to go the farthest away from home. I wanted to have the most interesting experience ever. And looking back now, I'm 29, I was 18 years old. I have no idea like what was going through my head. And I remember being nervous to go, but it honestly wasn't even because it was a historically black college. It was just moving outside the country, being away from home. Um, so that's a little of my backstory. And obviously now my husband is black. So that's just a little tiny snippet of my background. Um, 
I will dive into different experiences or things that I've witnessed. So this week has been a lot. Obviously, I can never understand, but I've heard from a lot of my friends, my family, different experiences. And then I was trying to look back onto experiences that I had when I was younger, trying to recall, like, when has this been an issue that maybe I overlooked it? And it brought me back to when I was 15 years old. Like I said, where I come from, mostly white people, but there was one, we had one mixed kid in our class. And I remember other boys would joke and say the N word and like laugh. And I remember in that moment feeling uncomfortable, but seeing our mixed friend laugh as well. And looking back now, I wish that I would have said something because in that moment, I'm looking at him thinking like, he's okay. He's laughing too, but really he's not okay. And he just probably wanted somebody to say something to say that that was wrong. And it makes me sad that I didn't say anything then. Um, but fast forward, I think it was two years ago, similar situation. A friend, I can't remember if it was a song or if she just said the N word in, I don't know what happened. She said it and I called her out and I said, that is not okay. You can't say that. And I was with a family member who was mixed and I'm glad that I'm so glad that I called her out because, you know, obviously there's been growth and understanding since that first situation. And she apologized to me because obviously she knows Jimmy and, you know, that's offensive, obviously to my husband, but me, to me too. And, um, and then she went on to apologize to our family member. And so that's an example, you guys, of, I was on my stories talking of, you know, you can say that you're not racist, but you need to be the one to step in and intervene because I watched a video and I thought it was so powerful from um, Patrice, I forget her last name. And, you know, she said a situation happened and nobody said anything. Nobody stood up for her. She's in shock. Why would they have to stand up for themselves? Somebody else needs to intervene and stand up for them. So I hope that from me sharing that, if you ever encounter a situation that you're the one even if you don't know what to say, even if you cuss them out, you just have to say something. Say, like, make it known that that is not okay and that they are in the wrong. And hopefully that makes them never say it again or never do something like that again. So that, that is my experience. And that is, had other ones, but I thought that that was a good one to share. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate that so much. And I appreciate your heart and your vulnerability in that. Um, and I think she brought in a really good uh, way for me to include. Um, I want you to think about this. I'm going to say it out loud and I'm going to ask you uh, if you are on the left side or if you are on the right side. Are you someone that you understand that all humans deserve to be treated equally? Are you someone that you do not outwardly demonstrate hate towards black people or people of color? And are you someone you are not active in your efforts and may be seen as neutral? Or are you on the side where you are actively trying to dismantle racism? Are you trying to learn about your own privilege and your own biases? Are you speaking up when it matters? And do you support anti-racism and the policies that are included. So the first side, the left side, is I am not racist. That's what many people say. But we need more people to be an activist and an ally for anti-racism, which is on the right side. So um, segueing into Lee. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you, Mariah, for organizing this and for all the women speaking today. Um, this is uh, something that, although we're doing it today, I hope that these sort of conversations continue within your organization and your communities because um, it's sad to see us get all riled up and do this. And then, uh, you know, in a day or two, it's back to business and the rest of us are kind of left in the dust. So um, 
My name is Lee Aziz. Um, I grew up in upstate New York. Uh, I grew up in the areas where racism is loud and proud. Um, people often think, oh, New York? And, no, it's, it, it exists. Um, my, um, when I was a kid, I was about, well, since I was born, my mother had multiple sclerosis. And so um, when it got bad around the age of four, I had to, we had to move in with my grandparents. Now, my father is black. My mother was white, um, very Irish family. Um, I had to uh, move in with my grandparents. My grandfather had just uh, retired from Carrier. They bought a house out in the country. It was going to be great. And then um, I turned five and it was time to start kindergarten. There's a couple different stories I'm actually going to tell. Um, but my first day of kindergarten, I got on the bus with my little Star Wars lunch pail and the kids that got on in these rural areas started saying, who let this little nigger on the bus? Move that nigger to the back of the bus. And it was this on, they're just roaring in laughter. And I'm coming from a place where I didn't even know what that meant. And so I'm going through school. This is kindergarten. This continued on and on and on. And when I got into junior high, I remember I was in, or, well, middle school, I was in the sixth grade and you had to, go around through the eighth grade hallway to get to your science classes on the other side of the building. Well, or you could cut through the library and you weren't allowed to cut through the library. But when I would go down the eighth grade hall, they would throw papers at me, they would spit at me, they'd say, tell me niggers aren't allowed in this hallway. And so I would try to duck my already super tall self through the library and the librarian who was scary used to yell at me and give me lunch detention. Um, I would, the kids would talk about how they were having sleepovers. And um, not uh, you're, not, you're not invited because my dad doesn't let niggers in our house. I tried to tell him, you don't act like a nigger, but we just can't have niggers in our house. And so I started to act out. No one ever asked me, none of the teachers advocated for me. None of the teachers, they would pay attention to my behaviors, my attitude. I, was, I had attitude, parent-teacher conferences, all this stuff and I'm sitting here thinking like you guys don't see what these kids are doing to me every day um as I got older um I think I was probably in the eighth grade the KKK came to our town to march and recruit and the night before their parade they sent out hate mail into my mailbox and it was a uh, Harriet Tubman lookalike contest and um, it was like, you know, third prize was a lifetime supply of watermelon. Um, I don't remember what second prize was, but first prize was a one-way ticket back to Africa. And I didn't know about this. My neighbors actually brought it to my grandmother's attention. And nobody said anything. Nobody ever said anything. And so eventually I left that school, I had to lie about my address, use a relative's address to go to a different school because I wanted to play basketball and not be scared to go to school. Um, I remember being a little kid and living in a white family where when I would say something, the response was, well, if you didn't act so black, they wouldn't call you that because you're still pretty lightly. And I remember sitting on the porch and trying to rub it off my skin. I remember kids being afraid to touch me because they thought it was gonna come off on them. And as you can see, I'm pretty light, but I was just dark enough. This is something that happens, but I think what hurt the most is no one said anything. No one. And I ran, I felt weak because I ran to another school. And when I got out of there, I went to college and I, I left the country trying to get away from this. And what I want now is for other people, when you see this stuff happening, for God's sakes, say something. Because it's scary when it's just you against everyone else. It's scary when you send your children out. It's not about you guys saying you have black friends. It's not about you guys. 
always just just having to really feel it. But as she said, this is this is anti racism. You're not going to know what it feels like, but God, like, how can people just stand by and let it happen? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for sharing that. Hard truths. Um, I see so many of you sharing your comments, your prayers, your thoughts. You're like saying, how, why? Like, I don't get it. It's every day, day in and day out. Um, now I'm going to segue to my beautiful friend, Daniela. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Daniela, and I'm from Toronto, Ontario. I am an entrepreneur teen beach body coach and a mother. Um, just hearing about Lee's story is, oh, I'm so emotional right now. That is incredibly hard. And um, I admire your bravery for sharing that um, because racism like that is real. Me personally, I grew up in Toronto, so things are a little different up here. Um, racism is real, but Canadians do it in a very passive aggressive and joking way. Everything is about jokes. Um, people will say comments in a joking way. And if you are a person of color and you're in that situation, it's super uncomfortable. Just like um, one of the examples Virginia gave about the mixed person in Saskatchewan, they just laugh it off. Um, it, and it, it, it hurts you to the core because it makes you feel like there is something inherently wrong with you. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty heartbreaking. But in this country, Canadians like to believe we are, like generally the, the greater population is amazing. But we have a problem in this country when it comes to racism, especially towards the First Nations, Métis, and Native American peoples. Yes, there is racism everywhere but it's if one suffering we all suffer and the anti-black racism in this country like i said it's it's very covert it's in the workplace um there's i've heard stories of people who work hard but don't get promotions and you wonder why they do everything and everything that, that the next person beside them does but because of the way they look or from where they're from, they're passed over. So I, I just think we need to be aware of this stuff. And um, when you see it, call it out. Again, I am a girl who grew up around a lot of white people. I was always the only black woman. And for me, it didn't really, you know, I really didn't notice. It wasn't until people started pointing it out to me in subtle passive aggressive ways. I've had many incidences in school where this has happened. Um, and the thing about it is, it is so important to just call it out. Don't be silent about it. Because when you're silent about it, you perpetuate it. I've heard stories from my white friends where you would hear people say, I'm not racist, but, and then go on to say something racist. So the important thing here is you gotta be honest with yourself. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what I'm, I'm, am I doing? Is this bringing unity or is this dividing us? And I truly believe like the only way we are going to eliminate this is for people to take that journey within to take that self-love journey. Because anyone who's spewing out hate like that must be in a tremendous amount of pain. And it is so important that you work on yourself to eliminate that pain and to love that pain and to spread that love to other people. And everyone who's on this call right now, I thank you so much because that is exactly what you're doing. You're here, you're here unlearning things that you may have learned as a kid or growing up you're here wanting to change and i'm mad i have mad respect for that and thank you <laughs> thank you so much daniela um tori if you wouldn't mind sharing us sharing with us your story and your experience that you witnessed yeah so hi everyone 
Um, I'm going to come from a very different standpoint. Uh, I'm from a super small town in Iowa of 200 people, only white farmers. Didn't really experience anything outside of white until probably college, and I'm engaged to um, a black man. So I come from, I was, didn't, didn't notice it, very unexperienced with it, very oblivious to it, um, probably until my, I would say like a year ago. And we've been in a relationship for six years. So I hear a lot of times, especially like my loved ones and friends will say, you know, I'm not racist because I have a black friend. I'm not racist because I am married to a black man. But at the end of the day, you can still be racist because you're not willing to stand up in those situations. You're not willing to learn about everything that's going on. You're not willing to see it. And that's where I came from until a year ago. The most eye-opening thing was... Um, in my master's degree, it took me going back to school and learning about diversity and all the things to really open up my eyes. Um, and then this whole situation opened it up to um, later on, we're going to talk about Jenna and I's conversations and just hearing some of the things that I brushed under the rug, didn't think anything of it. The three situations, I have a couple situations um, we were talking about one time we were at a bar and he was the only black man in the room and a fight broke out. He had nothing to do with it. Like if you guys know him, like he's not a fight of the most respectful man in the world, but the bartender instantly walked up to him and asked him to get out and they were going to call the cops on him. Um, and I, at the moment ran off to friends and didn't acknowledge anything. My mom came and picked us up, um, to drive us home, but I still up until three days ago, didn't know about that situation. Um, so you can be in a relationship, you can be around other people and still not acknowledge it. But at the same time, I'm willing to learn and willing to grow. And I think a lot of you guys are in that same situation as me and you're willing to grow and you're willing to learn and you're willing to be open. Um, and that's powerful too. So during this conversation, I just want you guys to like listen and hear, but then do something about it as well. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tori. Um, and then last me, I am, I don't think I even said this, I'm a, my name's Dr. Mariah White. I am a five-star qualifying Beachbody coach. I am a um, currently full-time, due to COVID, <laughs> full-time Beachbody coach at the moment. I will be going back to treat tiny humans because being a pediatrician is a passion of mine. Um, I was born in Landstuhl, Germany. Um, my dad was in the military and met my mom over there. And then, thank you so much, one more week, um, and then uh, we moved to Arizona. Um, my experience is very different. Uh, I need you to understand that in, it, even though in other countries, which she'll talk about later, other countries do experience racism. However, Germany is one of the countries that are standing together in the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's because, if I'm being honest, German loves, Germans love Black men and black people and it's just the way that it is. Um, so as a German African American, I wasn't, ex I didn't experience racism the way that some of my friends who were in the U.S. did until I moved to the U.S. So my dad being in the military, he is a six, nine black man who uh, did a really good job protecting me. He kept me on the Air Force Base where I went to school and that wasn't allowed. And I didn't really see it until we moved off the Air Force Base and he put me in a public school in Little Surprise, Arizona, where I was forced to pick sides. If my hair was curly, I was black. If my hair was straight, I was white. When I played basketball, I was black. When I played volleyball, I was white. I had to choose every single day. I had to choose the crowd of people. I had to choose to stand up. And I remember being on the other side and two sides of it, right? Because I'm biracial. The ridicule and hate that I received from my black friends because I would say, stop saying the N-word. If you want them to stop saying it, you stop saying it. And I would get hate and be like, that's why you're white. Go hang out with your white friends, Mariah. You're not a part of us. So I go home crying my hair was straight, I'd go wash it, make sure it was really, really froey. And then I'd go back to my black friends and be like, am I accepted now? Do I fit in now? Am I good enough now? And then volleyball season would roll around and oh, you guys don't understand, it takes three hours to do this. But I would make sure that my hair was straight and I'd walk into practice. 
And I would show up and I would spend, and I was a really good volleyball player, but I would spend the first month trying to prove that I was white enough and that the division that I was creating didn't exist. So then as I go, I stopped playing basketball um, in college and I decided to play volleyball. So I was a collegiate volleyball athlete. And I remember feeling the same way Alex did because I went to practice and obviously freshmen have to earn their spot. But I remember that we did this thing called cauldron. And Jen, as a volleyball player, probably knows what I'm talking about. I was an outside hitter, truly I'm a middle. And I had to beat out every single one of my teammates. Well, when I say I beat out every single one of my teammates, I beat out every single one of my teammates. Every single one. And where did I sit every single game? On the bench. Every freaking game, I sat on the bench. Every practice, I beat out every one of my white teammates. And I said, Mariah, it's okay. They're paying for your education. It's okay to swallow your pride. But they didn't realize that volleyball was my only safe place. That volleyball was the only place that I felt like I was good enough. But it didn't matter because my skills didn't outbeat my white friends. And then I remember having a conversation with my coach years after, because I transferred to a four-year university and I started playing. And I went back to my coach and I said, why didn't you let me play even though I was better than that? And she said, it made you better, didn't it? It made you stronger, didn't it? And it did. But that's not the lesson she should have taught me. She should have taught equality and fairness. She should have taught that everybody deserves a right and deserves a seat at the table. So guys, when I sit there, and if it wasn't so far away, I'd pull it off. That diploma that sits on my wall that says Dr. Mariah Karen White, I did that because I was Black. I did that because I wanted to be seen as equal. I did that because I wanted to fight for a seat at the table. And then fast forward, as a board certified pediatric nurse practitioner, I will get called the N-word. I will have patients ask for me to grab one of my, black, or my white colleagues to come in and validate what I'm saying. And then, and this is the last thing I'm gonna share, I was in an office that was completely and utterly toxic, and that is why I decided to leave. But I will never forget when multiple black patients and families would be like loud in the middle of the hall and be like, finally, we have a black doctor in here. Go you, way to go. I wanna see her. And you know what? I would just sit there and inside I'd be like, yes, thank you for acknowledging me. And then I'd look around at all my older white doctor colleagues mm -hmm. and they would just be like, here we go. There they go doing this again. All right. And it was like, no, I earned this. I deserve to be here. I deserve to be respected. And I will take care of you if you are black, brown, purple, pink, blue. I will take care of your child. I will save your child. There, you don't even know how many body bags I've had to put people in, babies. You don't know how many ribs I've had to crack and CPR I've had to give. And it doesn't matter anyone's color. My job, my duty is to save your life. And I put up a post not too long ago. When you see me and I need to save your daughter or son's life, in that moment, do you see color? Do you see that I'm black? No, you just see somebody with the resources, with the ability to help you. See me like that all the time, not just when it's convenient for you. Okay, thank you so much for letting all of our speakers share our story. Um, I am going to ask five rhetorical questions, but not really. I don't want anybody unmuting themselves. You can put in the chat me, or you can be brave and raise your hand. But I want you to look around your screen, and I want you to see how many hands are raised. I'm going to ask five simple questions, and it's just a hand raise, and then I'm going to go on to the next question. I ask that you are honest with yourself, honest with the people on this call, and honest and knowing that this is a safe place for you to execute your right to share your feelings and your emotions. 
So the first question is, have you ever witnessed racism in your life or was a di direct recipient of racism? Put your hands down. Thank you. Have you ever experienced being the only person of color, of your color, in a room and felt uncomfortable, uneasy, nervous, or unsettled? Thank you. Have you ever experienced the feeling of starting a new school, moving to a new state, or starting over in a college or university in unfamiliar territory and felt nervous or unsure? Thank you. Have you ever felt like someone was attacking your character and you were not afforded the ability to defend your true self? Thank you. Now parents, think of your children, non-parents. Think of a child or children close to you, such as a niece, nephew, etc. Have you ever experienced a time when these children have been impacted by something harmful that left you feeling helpless? So my dear friends, I thank you in sharing that. I don't know about you, but in my screen, every hand was raised. Every hand was raised. I saw a flood of me and hand raising in the chat. I want you to see the unity on all of that. I want you to see the beauty of that and seeing that there was nothing associated to black or white. There was nothing associated. I was asking open-ended questions about you as a person. Now I want you to look at it from a different perspective and understand that your black counterparts that are on this call and in life that you know, experience a feeling like that every single day. You might move once. You might feel helpless once, but this is something we experience every single day. So um, as we transition from that question, I would like to give the floor to Tori. She is a social worker and child therapist for ages zero to five. She is currently getting her master's degree and she's going to help the parents. So for those of you who are parents, I ask you to have your notebooks open. Um, Lee as a special education teacher and me as a pediatrician, we will all be giving you tips and ideas in order to help your kids and you as a family navigate this. So uh, Tori, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you. I'm super excited. I'm kind of nervous, but this is something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, in this sense of every day I talk about family systems, family dynamics, and the conversation I'm going to have with you guys today is mainly what I talk to my parents about every single day. Um, so I want to start it with, um, I'm not done with my master's. I just saw that comment. I will be done with my master's in like six months. So I'm still in my program. Um, but I've done my internships and everything. So I'm super excited. But the first thing I wanted to open it up with is um, today it should make you uncomfortable. We know as beach body coaches, we hear all the time that, um, sorry, I was trying to change that, that you have to get outside your comfort zone to, if, in order for change to happen, right? A lot of us are uncomfortable after we're hearing these stories. A lot of us are like, okay, we need to do something. What should we do next? Um, so just being open and hearing these stories is super powerful. And I've had a lot of you reach out to me about, you know, what do I say to my kids? You want a tangible, you want a script. I can't give you that. I can't tell you what to say to your kids. I don't know your standpoint on it. I don't know your beliefs on it. I don't know what conversations you've had and haven't had. I can't give you a script, but I am going to give you um, a little bit of like development, a little bit of when, why, should, how types of things, and hope that you can take what information, the stories that you're hearing, the things that I'm going to give you and then go and implement that so that you can help your kids understand. Um, but I want to start with the should. Should you have the conversation with your kids? And the answer is absolutely. Because the second that you're silent is reinforcing racism. Because kids are going to draw to conclusions. Kids are extremely smart no matter what you want to say. No, they are, I like to tell my parents, think about it as um, kids have these gray clouds in their heads all the time with question marks. If they do not know the answer to that question, they're going to draw their own conclusion and come with their own answer. They're going to figure out what to say, how to answer that question without them knowing it. Children are experiencing racism every single day without us knowing it. 
at school, on sporting events, Mariah and Alex shared their experience growing up. They're experiencing it every day. So if we're not having those conversations, regardless of what race you are, they're going to experience it differently and you need to be having those conversations. Um, I wanted to go a little bit into development, but I'm not gonna go super deep. But when a child is born, obviously zero days, zero months, they, they're not, they don't know the difference. But by three months old, they are because they're identifying familiar faces of their caregivers. They are recognizing who's caring for them, who's around them, and who they're exposed to. So at as young as three months old, this is where you should be having exposure. I come from a town of 200 people with only white people in there. I had no experience. I had no exposure. But what can you do in those moments? There's dolls. Think about all my white girls on here. What were all your dolls? What were all your Barbie dolls? Mine were all white Barbie dolls with blonde hair. On the flip side of it, Mariah and I were having this conversation the other day. All of Alicia's dolls are black. All of Alicia's dolls are of brown skin, something of that aspect. Having dolls that are more diverse, having books, having movies around and allowing them to see that. But the biggest thing I think as well is just the exposure and the culture. If you live in a small town where you have to, don't have to stay in this box, but you're in this box, allowing your kids to get outside of that box, taking a vacation, seeing other exposures, seeing other cultures and allowing your kids to experience that because they learn from experience. They learn from exposure. There's a ton of books out there on Amazon. There's a ton of movies out there. There's a ton of dolls out there. So think about the toys, the exposure, the culture, and just allowing your kids to experience other things. And then fast forward to like three years old. Three years old is when they start like picking, um, picking and choosing who they're going to play with. So they're probably not having those conversations yet. They're probably saying things, but not as much. Um, but then five years old is when you definitely need to be having those conversations because they're having those conversations. They're having the racist comments because kids are a direct mirror of their parents. They're going to school, seeing and doing what their parents are doing, and that's how they're going to do it. And that's like when kindergarten happens. That's when kids are experiencing all of that. So having that conversation is definitely needed, but allowing your kids to have that exposure and experience. Um, and then when. I wanted to answer when. At first, you have to be comfortable with this conversation yourself. Um, if this conversation today is making you uncomfortable, that means that you need to grow a little bit more. That means you need to learn a little bit more because you need to have, at three months, it's about the exposure, right? But at three years old and five years old, kids are going to ask you questions. You need to be asking your kids open-ended questions. What have they experienced? What do they know? What do they believe? Because you need to navigate that conversation one way or the other. If they have... Um, a belief that you don't agree with, that's where you need to correct them. But you have to be confident in your stance, in your beliefs, and comfortable in the conversation so that you can have that conversation as well. Um, at about three years old, that's when I would start veering the um, conversations more about values. So I like to tell my parents, you know, when you go to your child's first grade uh, parent-teacher conferences, what are the values you want them to say that how they're acting in school? A lot of good to say kindness respectful, friendly. Some people I, I've had my parents say like smart, but whatever values. And that's where I would tie your directions to. Tie your conversations around, okay, kindness. What does kindness mean? You're kind to everyone, no matter their skin color. But in the same sense, kindness of, you know, it's out of respect to stick up for your friends and having those conversations about your morals, having those conversations tied in with um, your beliefs. And then also having the conversation as, we do see color. That's probably the biggest thing Ryan and I am talking about is stop with the whole, we don't see color. We're treating everybody the same. We do see color. And your child needs to know that it's okay to be friends with a black girl. It's okay to be friends with a white girl. It's not okay to treat her different because of that. And we need to address that with our kids as well. And they need to know that. Um, I think I'm hitting on everything. I wanted to end it with um, proactive versus reactive. So as a white human, I don't have to have proactive conversations with, well, my kids I will because my kids are going to be black, uh, mixed. But as white humans, we don't have to have those conversations prior to um, our kids going to school because we don't think about it. But um, a black mom has a conversation with her kids about, you know, being around white kids, what pot potentially could happen, being pulled over by a cop. Be, having an interaction with a cop, they have those conversations. But going forward, 
we can only be reactive for a lot of us now, but we could be proactive. We need to have those conversations and be clear and have our kids understand and have those conversations today. I don't know if you want to open it up to questions, but I can't provide you guys with this script, but just having a better understanding of where you stand and that the conversation is definitely important. Yeah, do me a favor, everyone. Um, drop, like, write down your questions for me, and then at the end, we'll open it up. And if you need to directly ask a question to Tori, um, please, please do so at that time, um, just so that we can re be respectful of everyone's time and keep it moving. Um, thank you, Tori, so much for sharing that as a social work standpoint and just speaking to the therapy aspect and helping parents. Um, as a pediatrician, I am going to just kind of touch on the same way that a lot of parents come into my office and ask, well, when should I be expecting crawling? When should I be expecting walking? When should I introduce foods? What types of foods? How do I prevent choking? All of these are what we call anticipatory guidance questions. Your pediatrician, and if you do not have a pediatrician that ask these tough questions. I want you to challenge your pediatrician because at the end of the day, we are all humans. Um, but I want you to ask the question of when should I be having these conversations? When should I be talking to my child? Because every child is different, right? Like I've seen some moms say, well, my kid's autistic. And some parents say, well, I have a Down syndrome ch child. Obviously things are very different for each and every single one of the children. But the whole point and premise is having the difficult conversation. I want you to understand that as, and I can only speak for America, my Canadians in UK and France, I love you guys, but I can only speak here. Um, what we go against or go by is the American Academy of Pediatrics. And the American Academy of Pediatrics for about seven years now has targeted social, social determinants and racism as a goal. So we have goals every year. We had this Healthy People 2020 that we needed to go towards. One of the biggest thing is, and I'm not going to read the whole quote for you, but it's dismantle ra racism. Dismantle it. Abolish it. Get rid of it. And people, and as a person who's passionate about children, we need to take care of our children first, because if you think about it, they are the future generations that's going to help continue to allow this racism talk to become dismantled. So when you're thinking about your child or other children, maybe let's just say children on your block, all of us were just directly impacted by COVID-19, right? Did you ever in your mind think about potentially white or black, the disparities within that household? Did you think to say, can they afford Wi-Fi? Are they getting on Zoom meetings? Do they even own a laptop? These are questions you have to ask. Now go a step further. We talk about COVID-19 directly impacting our African-American community. Why? They are at a higher risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease. Why? Because they don't have the resources and metabolically, like that's, that's the makeup of African-Americans. So I'm not going to discredit that. But are we evaluating that every time, and I'm going to speak to coaches, every time you interact or send an invite with a black woman or black male, and they say, hey, I can't afford it, or hey, I'm a single mom, or hey, it's just not a good fit. I want you to understand that now more than ever, they need us. Now more than ever, they need our help, not just to help them with their superfoods and immunity and all these things, but to reduce high blood pressure and hypertension, to reduce the rates of diabetes that are skyrocketing across the country in African-American communities. This is the time to speak. So when you're sitting there and you're thinking about kids, I saw one, um, Kim Fitzpatrick did an amazing post, an amazing post. She said, oh, I'm gonna cry. She said, mamas, I'm gonna teach my babies to love your babies. And as a mom, I was like, oh, Kim, thank you. But now I'm gonna take it a step further. When you're thinking and you're trying to teach your children, your babies to love my babies, I want your kids to now understand that they need to look around their classroom. And then if their classroom looks white, they're like, wait, I know I had a couple of my black peers. I had a couple of black friends. Why aren't they on? Now I need you to ask this question. Do they have laptops? Do they have 
the ability to get onto Wi-Fi? Do they have the ability to have the resources that you have within your home? Now, I'm not, not asking you to go out and be a saint or a martyr and help every Black person that you can come into contact with. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what people want in general. But I want you to open your eyes and ask those tough questions. I want you to see that. And then as pediatricians, I want to... I, like you can either raise your hand or drop it in the chat. As moms, I want you to think back to a time where your pediatrician or nurse practitioner, whoever you see, physician's assistant, all of us united, unanimously as healthcare professionals should be asking questions. We should be asking, do you have food in your fridge? Do you have clothes for your children? Do your, does your child have a bed? Do you have a car to get to and from the places that you need to get to and from from? Now I'm going to ask, is there, any pedi is there any parent that pediatricians has never asked that question? And then if you're like, man, I don't think my pediatrician ever asked that question. Now I want you to look down at your skin color and see why. That might be why. I can't speak for everyone, but it might be why. So I brought to the table within my previous practice and I said, there's a question <laughs> that you have to literally bypass in order to continue charting in your notes that pops up as a social determinant survey. My dissertation was on unintentional childhood injuries and my passion is truly social determinants such as racism. So I sat there and tried to execute, hey, every single healthcare provider needs to be asking, do you have food? Do you have clothes? Do you have access to these things? When it was addressed in a closed forum, um, it was said, I don't want to have that open conversation because I don't have the resources to help them. So then I asked a little bit deeper and I went a step further. I said, why? Well, we don't have a social worker on campus and we don't have these resources to be able to help them. So I already know if I ask the question, they're going to tell me that they don't have X, Y, and Z and I don't know how to help them. So then what happened? Every white or black or Mexican or person of color that ever was seen as homeless, seen as some type of social determinant where they were unable to give their child the resources that they need. You know who they saw? Me. You know who the, my white colleagues would send them to? Me. I am not, like, I'm not a specialist in this, but they would refer them and transfer them over to be my patients. Why? Because in a 10 minute appointment, I would take 20 minutes to make sure that they were okay. Now, that's not me tooting my own horn. That's what I'm saying that every healthcare provider needs to be doing. So if your healthcare provider has never asked that question or isn't talking to you about those tough things or has never asked you, do you have food in your fridge? That's not a question that you should be like, do you really think I can't afford food in my fridge? No, it should be. Thank you for asking that question. I do have food in my fridge. Thank you for asking every single person that comes into this office that question because everyone might not have food in their fridge. So I want you to think about that in terms of it and then kind of to end and segue to Lee and piggyback off of what Tori said. As a black woman raising two black beautiful girls, I do not have the privilege, oh what the privilege would feel like, I do not have the privilege to turn off the news, turn off the TV and not have this conversation. These are conversations that I have to have regardless. My daughter is one, 13 months old. Obviously, like Tori just said, at three months, they start to distinguish who their caregivers are. She's around a lot of different diverse people. So she has that. But Alicia, my bonus daughter, is five. Is that a conversation that we have to proactively have? Absolutely. Can I share that you said, Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask permission first. So, four, yeah. so at four years of age, Alicia was at her school, and I'm just going to give the cliff notes of it. They were talking about Easter. Easter was coming up, and one of her white peers said to her, and I don't quote this, but why are you getting excited? The Easter bunny doesn't come to brown people's houses. Alicia came home and didn't have that open conversation because she just was like, Alicia doesn't see color, but she, like, she sees color, but she doesn't understand it, right? At four years old, it's like, okay, I don't really get it, but it was, well, mommy, does the Easter Bunny come to brown people's houses? And then that opens up conversation, right? Now, I'm going to ask you, are you going to have to have those difficult conversations with your children if they're white? Probably not, but should you? Yes. 
Should you expose them to good resources? Absolutely. Should you have a diverse group of dolls in your collection? Absolutely. Should you have black and brown and all the different colors? Yes. And then in a different light, um, there's some really great resources that I'll share and it'll kind of circulate, but you should be asking them, especially if you have, and this isn't so much toddlers and preschool age, but if you have adolescents or especially teenagers, for my moms who have teenagers, you should, I encourage you to show the video of George Floyd. I encourage you to get on Netflix and use the resources and have open dialogue while it's happening see what their, their stance is. Because at the end of the day, just like Tori said, I can't tell you how to have a conversation. I can't give you a script. But the unanimous thing that I want you, the consensus that I want you to have within your house is what is your mission statement as a family? If it's faith-based, great. God loves everyone. God loves all children. If it's not faith-based, we believe in kindness and fairness and equal opportunity and health equality. And everyone is everyone and everyone is a human and we treat humans the way that they deserve to be treated. The golden rule, right? That's your mission statement. And then from your mission statement and value as a family, then go down and allow your kids to answer the question, ask the question. One of the things that Tori shared with me as we were talking about this is every child walks around with those little um, like thought bubbles, right? With question marks all the time. Are you going to be the one that is helping to answer the question or are you just going to sit back and be silent? Because at the end of the day, those questions will be answered, but you won't be able to dictate the narrative of that and stand for the value and mission of what your family stands for. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Lee. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a special education teacher, um, mild to moderate disabilities. I'm in uh, nine through 12. Um, before that, I taught English for two years. And then before that, I even taught English and um, social studies classes. I have always taught in Title I urban areas. I do not live in those areas. I, I don't know who's from where, but basically I was living in the Northeast in this place called Scottsdale, where it's golf courses and rainbows all the time. I had job offers out there, but I chose instead to drive 45 minutes to an hour to South Phoenix, where my schools were predominantly black and brown. Um, going into the English field, um, it was frustrating because I would have to ask permission to teach um, using um, African American history um, texts to my kids. Um, I would try to teach my kids that we can have more than one month to celebrate our history um, and then getting some a little bit of pushback from administration, but at the end of the day, having it all uh, work out. Um, and I, um, as I was teaching English, I was working on my master's degree to move into SPED because um, those of you who are teachers, especially my SPED teachers, <laughs> you don't do it for the money, okay? You do it because you're passionate about being a voice for the voiceless, um, teaching kids how to advocate for themselves. Um, so with that being said, I work very hard to educate your kids from the time they enter that door to the time they go home. Um, what's huge is, is that um, it has to be a collaboration with parents and teachers. It has to be collaboration with parents, community, the entire school. Um, I'm bringing this up because as we talk about the difference between what um, people with, with children of color, what we have to teach our kids versus white families, um, some of you might think, well, this doesn't really affect my kids. I don't want to expose them to this. And that's great that you have that choice to turn a blind eye. But if we're going back to my childhood growing up, that racism was taught, even if it was, even if it was to stay quiet. Um, if our kids aren't exposed to the education of race, race relations, um, people with differences, because from a special education standpoint, 
I'm going to have to, I mean, COVID hit, but we were talking about getting involved in different special education, um, community outreach uh, programs and stuff like that so that our children can be exposed to other people with disabilities. I don't want it to be like, a, oh, mommy, look at that. Oh, why does that person look like that? And the same thing happens as, as black people where little white kids see a black man coming and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, it's scary. So my request as, um, as an educator is for you guys to please join in with helping us educate, not just the stuff that is actually in the curriculum that is in the content that's going to be on the SATs, but let's help in socializing our students, our kids with people that in situations that do not look like them. Um, community wise, as I work in, um, in, in title one urban areas, which means that, okay, we're talking about everyone qualifies for free reduced lunches. Um, I have kids that are homeless that come to school. The only time they get to eat is when they come to school. I got kids that, um, they have to drop off their siblings because either mom's working several jobs or she's on the couch knocked out because she's a crackhead. Um, this is a situation where I've given my clothing to my students. And um, I got kids, we had a football team that was going for state. And um, we had a basketball team that was about to go for a state championship. And um, twice I've had kids come in after a practice meeting crying. Well, miss, they won't give us a chance. Well, what happened? Well, we had home field advantage, but nobody would come to our school to play. So instead of forfeiting, we were forced to go up north to their school. And what I'm saying this for is because if you live in an area that is privileged, I'm not asking you to be the great white hope. But what I am saying is, is that if you're looking around and you're noticing the difference, Let's talk about maybe a fair share. I shouldn't have to, these people shouldn't have to want to, if it's about athletics, to move their kid to an entirely different district so that they have a fair shot at, at their education or playing sports. It's time to kind of share the wealth and share the education. If you find that we've literally had a white team say to us, well, we don't want to come to your school because we fear for our lives. You guys can't come to South Phoenix for a basketball game at four o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. And instead of the league forfeiting the game because they refused to come, instead of finding a neutral spot with home court advantage again, we were forced to go there. The kids start a fight on the court. Hundreds of white people come out of the stands and attack my kids. The cops are called and who do you think is getting detained at the school? my black babies. This is real. And the thing is, is that racism will talk. Now, maybe some of those kids weren't saying anything. Maybe some of those parents didn't do anything, but everybody just kind of went home. And so please start to educate your kids. Please don't dangerously expose them to everybody's differences and everybody's suffering. But at the end of the day, they don't know what they don't know. Just like right now, you don't know what you don't know. And in order for us to stop this cycle of ignorance, and I don't mean that in, in a negative way, literally, you just don't know what you don't know. Kids need to know now because they are the next generation of either knowing or not knowing. So that's, that's my spiel from an educational standpoint. No, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, so I hope that was helpful, parents, in helping you, um, for those of you who are parents, non-parents, helping to raise other children, children in general just need this positive feedback and just this awareness. So I appreciate you. Again, any questions specifically towards this topic of parenting, please write it down and then we'll ask uh, for the Q&A. Um, next, I'd like to open the floor to Dr. Watson and Dr. Scroggins to have a conversation as a black woman coming to Hampton and a white Canadian coming to Hampton. Uh, Virginia bravely talked about um, her experience with that, but also how uncomfortable she must have felt going to a predominantly black school a historical black college, and then Alex being on the receiving end. Uh, I know some of you guys follow all three of us or one or two of us on social media. You see 
how close we are. And I just want them to talk about how their friendship kind of blossomed, came together, but also their perceptions of both of those two women being in a school like that. So uh, Alex, if you want to go first, being the historical black woman at the college, and then Jen can kind of chime in and you guys can kind of banter, uh, talk back and forth. Yeah, so, um, so for me, my parents went to an HBCU, historically black college and university. Uh, like I said, they're first generation. So I grew up, you know, colleges have homecomings. And I remember growing up and even though I lived in an area where it was mostly white people. The only time I got to be around a lot of black people was to go see my cousins who lived in New York still. I loved every single fall going to a and to my parents' college and just getting to see all the diversity, getting to see my parents like interacting with all these black people who I don't really get to see when I'm at home and they're working in their workplace. So I knew when I got older, I really wanted to have that experience because it just seemed so uplifting. Everyone accepted you. There was no weirdness. It was just so, it just felt so um, encouraging for you to just be who you are. And so I, like I said, you guys, I got accepted to a ton of schools. Like my dad is the type of person who's like, have tons of options. So I applied to 11 schools, got into every single one of them, got full rides to many of them, but I chose the one that was an HBCU. And the popular belief is, oh, like that was home. Like when you got there, you felt like completely accepted and, and you didn't have any issue assimilating to it. But the reality is, like I said, I grew up at predominantly white schools. So it may be popular belief that, oh, you went to an HBCU, like, oh, you felt comfortable. No, I didn't. I actually didn't because I had zero experience being with other people who were educated and looked like me. Most of the people who I had been in contact with, a lot of my cousins who live in like the, the inner city of different places, they're not as educated as me. They didn't have the opportunities I had. Thank God I had the parents that I had who were college educated. So when I got to Hampton, I didn't necessarily feel like home. I had to assimilate to a completely new culture than what I had grown up around. So when I first met Virginia, low key, I felt more comfortable around her and like, oh my God, like another white girl. Like you're, I, I get you. Like, I, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's not what you think. So, um, like I said, that's why it, it's, it's all in perception and like how you grew up and you really don't know people and you don't know the type of environments that they've grown up in and why they're relating to you the way you are, why you feel towards me, this, this endearment, because I, I know how to establish that with people. I can connect with people from all different places because I've lived a lot of different places. Um, so when I did meet Virginia, we had in common that we played sports growing up. She was tall. And like I said, like she was a white girl. I knew how to deal with white girls. So <laughs> yeah, that was my experience when I first met Jen. Oh, it's so funny. And this was um, 11 years ago. So it's, it's funny trying to recall, like, because I just, some things I don't really remember. But so I didn't even know what an HBCU was, to be completely honest. Um, I got the offer and the volleyball coach, I got a volleyball scholarship, just to let you guys know. And he offered for us to come visit. Um, and that was really eye opening, actually, when I came to visit. Um, we went around the campus with the coach and everyone was so welcoming. And I don't know if it was because I was with the coach, they knew I was on a visit. I have no idea. Either way, it impressed us to the nines. And everyone was opening the door saying hello hi miss how are you and being from Canada like I mean people say hello but they don't really say hello they do not go out of their way to make you feel like that so it was just like wow this is gonna be great like everyone's so nice and so that was my experience on the visit which was awesome I'm glad that I got to go visit and I was like okay I'm gonna go and um, luckily our, I was on a volleyball team, so I knew I was going to be fine because I was already par a part of a team growing up. I moved multiple times. I moved in the 10th grade and the school was nine to 12. So in the ninth grade, everybody makes their friends, right? 10th grade, you're the new kid. So I already got an experience of eating my lunch in the bathroom by myself. And I feel like having that experience, I was like, it's okay. Like, I know I'll make friends. It'll be all right. And immediately our volleyball team was, they're my friends right away. And we went to school a month earlier 
And so I was, I was close with all of them and they were from all over. We had people from the US, Canada, Bulgaria, Serbia, Puerto Rico, Colombia, like literally we were like the international volleyball team. So it was great to have that right away. Um, but in our dorms, we are at different, um, you know, freshman, sophomore, whatever. So we're split up. So in the dorms, it's a different experience. And there were times that I did feel uncomfortable and I just didn't really know how to navigate, but I'm the type of person that's just going to shut up and just like figure it out, be quiet because I don't want to offend anyone. So that's what I did. And I listened and learned so much. And like Alex said, a lot of people were going out of their way to be friends with me and they would share that, you know, my school was all white, like, I want to be friends with you. And they would go out of their way to make me feel comfortable. So that was nice to have. And that's how I became friends. Alex and I were like a couple doors down in our dorm. And that's one thing that I've tried to take with me going forward is because I do remember during those six years, every day in a point in my day, I felt uncomfortable like it it just is what it is um but going forward in situations when i see people of different ethnicities i just try and be nice just try and smile just say hello just be polite because if you say nothing they may assume that you don't like them and that may not be the case but i need you guys to go out of your way to be outwardly positive and smile and make them feel welcomed and another, this is the last thing I'm going to touch on because we were talking about um, Black history. I had no idea. They do not teach any of that in Canada. Um, I think I, I knew about slavery, but I had no idea the extent. So I'm the only white person in Black history class. And it was, it was in detail. I'm sure that it was all the way to the nines, correct? Watching videos that were horrific. And I'm sitting there like, I understand why a lot of black people do not like white people. They probably hate me. And sitting in that class, I was just like, whoa, like it was, it was a crazy experience, but opened my eyes to understand when people have issues talking to people of different races, not saying that it's okay, but I can understand, I can be empathetic why they may not like talking to other races and they may want to stay within their race and not talk to other people. And luckily in that situation, our professor was so kind. And I, I feel like he probably felt me being uncomfortable. And he, the whole time I was at Hampton, he always would say, hello, Virginia, how are you? Uh, nice to see you, hope you're doing well. And so I knew I was comfortable there, but it was just really eye-opening. And I'm glad that right now with everything going on, um, these are things that I've known because I was in that class. Everyone hasn't had that experience. And I'm not about to make these videos. I don't, ha I don't have the knowledge, but, I've been sharing because they are powerful and I think people need to know black history and I have no idea why they don't go in depth and mesh it all together and that's my hope going forward that you know eventually they can make history history period and put it all intertwined. And that was powerful Alex that was powerful thank you so much so you just heard two very different women right? One black, one white Canadian and saying both of them were very uncomfortable, but they went in, sorry. They went in to a very <clears throat> uncomfortable situation and found comfort within that, right? Alex expressed like, hey, I felt comfortable. She was a white girl. Like, let's do this. And Jen's like, okay, my team's black and from all these other places. And we just came together in solidarity. So I love that. Um, Jen, I know that Daniela had to hop off. Is there anything that you wanted to add as a white Canadian um, and just kind of moving forward with that? I would just say that, like, obviously I wasn't exposed very much, but just because you're not exposed doesn't mean it's not a problem. And it's, it doesn't mean that you can just hide. If you're a part of Team Beachbody, guys, there are people of color and you need to do your research, listen, learn, and really take the time to understand because if you don't, there may be a situation that you don't know how to react or you have no idea. And that's, that's unfortunate. And this is, and I hate the circumstances that everything is happening and coming to light and different conversations are coming up, but I think it's so powerful. So thank you for being on the call. That's the first step in the right direction. And just take these tips and apply them to your everyday life. 
Perfect, Jen. Thank you. Um, so as many of you guys know, we just launched in France, especially. I know there's a lot of different entrepreneurs on here, but Beachbody just launched in France. Um, we've already been in Canada, obviously, and we've been in the United Kingdom. Um, I wanted Lee to be able to touch on her experiences playing basketball and exposure to racism. France is one of the places that she did play. Um, so I'm just going to let her kind of shine a light on cultures and countries of, that have experienced racism. Okay. So I, I played overseas for a good 11 years. Um, my first year was in Tel Aviv, Israel. After that, I played in a couple of cities in Turkey. Then I played in Italy for several years. And then um, my last year, I played in Lyon, France. Um, each country had its own thing when it came to black people but it is it's, it's not quite the same as it is here in the united states but you still get it um i think the biggest thing was um they look at you and you get a pass when you're one an american and two especially if you are an athlete so there would be other um especially in france um and, and even in Italy and Turkey, when you have um, people coming in literally from Africa, they're viewed as these dirty, um, crime-ridden people where they would say, oh, oh, you're an American? Oh, you're an athlete? Oh, okay, that's different. Um, I remember being in uh, Italy and I'm reading the newspaper and I'm finally speaking Italian at this point. And I'm like, what? Every time they're talking about me and my American teammate, they said, when the colored player enters the floor, when the colored player left the floor, when the colored player did this. So I go to the vice president of my team and I'm like, why does the newspaper keep calling us colored? He said, well, because that's what you are. Black people are colored. I said, excuse me, sir, but that's extremely offensive. Can you please tell them to stop addressing us as that? He said, oh, Lee, you're being too sensitive. This isn't like America. We don't have the slaves. It's okay. You're colored. I'm not colored, you're colored. And I sat there and I'm trying not to get angry with him because this is a teachable moment. Unfortunately, nothing was ever taught because he just was like, this, this is what it is, deal with it. And, um, you know, it, it, it was just, it's, 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 it's disheartening, um, it's frustrating. I always stuck out as a sore, as a sore thumb. Um, my other teammates always did. They always knew who we were. But again, we got a pass because we were Black American athletes. And it just goes back to my point that, you know, it doesn't really matter where you go. It's like we have to have that extra something in order to be respected. Okay, like when I, I you know, I look at Mariah and, I, and, and you know, it's like now I want to get my doctorate because I'm still trying to get that respect. When I sit in an, an administrative office that serves predominantly black communities and I never really people don't ask me anything unless an irate uh, black parent calls oh Miss Lee can you handle this one so um, across the globe this is an issue um, so you know it's not just here so it's not surprising for me to see other countries being supportive because this 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 is a global this is a global thing all right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I just wanted you guys to have the exposure that it's not just a U.S. issue. It is a everywhere issue. It's a world issue. So now I'm going to kind of help uh, some of my friends who say, well, I don't really understand because I have black friends or my fiance or husband is black. So I'm going to open up the floor to Tori and Virginia, who are in an uh, inter-multiracial couple, um, and they're going to touch on how it can be difficult, but how together they can learn and unlearn. And then later, me and Lee are going to go into how to raise biracial children from that, that relationship. So Jen, Tori, please go ahead and unmute yourself. I feel like Virginia and I were talking about this. I think we're kind of on the same page. So maybe we could kind of like bounce off each other. But I think the biggest thing and the biggest takeaway for me is allowing to see his stance, allowing to hear his perspective and allowing him to speak on the experiences that he has experienced. Um, I feel like I just said experience like six times, but until we were able to sit down and have that conversation, 
I didn't know a lot of the things that I pushed under the rug through the last six years of our relationship. I hear how important it was to him and all the things that he's been through that I didn't do anything about, that I did shove under the rug and didn't think anything of it and made that excuse and justified those behaviors. And then I think about like our future, like that's not not okay. But at the same stance, like if I can't do that now, how do I expect to do that for my future children? How do I expect to do that um, for the people that I love, like Mariah and her girls? Like I can't, if I'm not willing to do it for him in the situations now, I can't do it moving forward. And just allowing to hear that stance of his side of it so that I could fully understand. Yeah. And we talked and that was our similar um, opinion. And then too, also, you know, something that I'm not proud of myself for doing in the past is questioning or trying to say the other perspective, like, no, they didn't mean that, you know, that's not where they're coming from. In those situations, you can never relate. You're never that person. You just need to sit and listen and ask, you know, what can I do to help or how can we make this better together? Don't ever question their feelings. And that's something that in the past I have done. And now especially I'm like that was wrong and um so going forward that's something that I want to do better and then also just know that this is a conversation that's going to come up it's not like hey we're on this call it's never we're never going to talk about it again my husband and I have had plenty issues conversations I won't go into details but it comes up a lot and you may think you know you see us together we're great yeah we're great but when you get thrown into different situations, it gets harder. So just be willing to listen and learn from one another and just be open to continuing to try and grow and do your best. I wanted to add one more other thing though, is the one thing that I did talk to John about is like bringing those things up, like a parent to me, like bring them up. Like I'm being open to it so that he can explain it, especially a lot of the times and a lot of the situations we've been talking about have been about our loved ones, my family, his family, my friends, his friends. Um, and sometimes those conversations could feel uncomfortable in the sense of like, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings because that's your fill in the blank. I don't want to hurt your feelings of whatever, but I applaud him for allowing for bringing that to my attention so that I, cause I didn't fully understand because of a lack of experience, a lack of not willing to see the other side of it. So having that conversation of like, bring that to my attention and being open to hear his side of it, because it is clearly happening now that we've had that conversation. And last thing, sometimes I have not been aware like, it's unfortunate that I can't pick it out or pick up on it on, on him feeling uncomfortable or even one of my friends feeling uncomfortable. So I encourage people on the other side too to express. And I know, you know, you may not get a great response, but, and it's not an excuse. And I wish that I could pick up more, but I am thankful every time somebody brings it to my attention so that the next time I can do better. And I'm just aware of the situation. Except, sorry, what was I saying? Especially because he's adapted to those situations. So for example, my, um, a little kid that we're around always calls him the brown boy when he approaches. To me, I didn't see that for the last six, year of our, six years of our relationship. I never brought that up. But now that he brought that up, I'm like, that's a big deal. But he's always just been okay with it and didn't say anything until we had the conversation last week about that. Right? Like he's just always had to adapt to it and couldn't say anything because he then would have looked like the crazy person in front of all of my family members. But we all know that that's not okay. But nobody said anything. I haven't said anything for the last six years. Yeah, that's huge, huge, huge. And then just um, to tie in a friendship relationship, um, Virginia and I, now she's one of my best friends. I needed some recover. She always says I needed shake I did it, it was recover. <laughs> and I, like we literally, <laughs> We didn't realize that we lived 15 minutes apart and meeting her in a parking lot. Like I wasn't scared and I wasn't like it was uncomfortable, but then we connected with volleyball. We connected with this, but I want to be honest with you guys and say that 
as a, I knew she was a super successful white beach body coach. And I knew I wanted to be her friend. It was her birthday. She invited me to go hiking with other white beach body coaches. And I knew I needed to adapt. And then it wasn't until I realized that she was married to Jimmy Scroggins. He was black. I go to her house. I see bridesmaid pictures. I think all of them were black. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, oh, okay. Okay. Now, now Mariah can be Mariah. Like now I can be my real self. So I want you to understand that it's not just in a real intimate relationship. It's in a friendship relationship. It wasn't until I realized that Jin went to Hampton university and a historical black college. And I'm like, oh, and then she introduced me to Alex. I'm like, yes. But I also want you to understand I had that same thing with Tori. Tori was one of my coaches found her on Instagram. She's a rock star, almost two-star coach. And I realized that she is engaged to a black man. Like these are all powerful things where it like gave almost credibility for me to be myself, gave credibility for me to feel comfortable, but that's not always the, a good thing. And then if you sit there and I just want you to briefly give yourself an audit, right? Give yourself personally an audit. When you are doing a picture, inviting to the community is your community showing diversity or is it showing segregation and this goes for both my black friends and my white friends there are times where i honest to god will sit there and be like oh i want to talk about the community and inclusion but they're i'm just surrounded by not i'm the only black person in the picture and then i'll sit there and be like crap i can't like and i'll have black women being honest with me like I had somebody honestly reach out to me and goes, no matter how many times people invite me to being a coach, I always say no because of this exact issue. There's nothing but white coaches. And I'm like, that's not fair. That's not fair. But then you see amazing black women who have other black women. And then it's like the other side where it's like a white person's like, dang, like, do I fit? Like, can I do this? So then you have the, the, the stigma almost of like, okay, white coaches go work with white coaches, black coaches go find a black coach and keep it very separated. And that's the point of not just friendships, not just interracial couples, not just raising biracial children, not just in healthcare, it's diversity and equality for all. So I ask you to do an audit check. Are you reaching out to both black, white, brown women because everyone needs this opportunity. Carl Deichler talks about 265 million people in just the US alone that need this. There's a lot of people that need this. There's a lot of humans that need this. So share this opportunity. Talk about the hard things. Be some place that's safety and of inclusion. And then for friends that of mine personally and professionally, if you are the person that's like, no, I'm not racist because I have a black friend. I want you to understand that that does not include you in not being racist. And it doesn't mean that you are anti-racism. And if you are exhausted, if you are feeling tired and fatigued of this conversation or the conversation of race, and you just want it to go away, I want you to also know that you are part of the problem because you've been exhausted for four days. Black people have been exhausted for 401 years. So I want you to feel exhausted. I want you to be tired of talking about it because then maybe you will change. Mm. One of my friends on an open call, on an open forum, sat there and said, and I shared this in a post if you guys want to read it more specifically. She's a dear friend of mine. We talk almost every day. And she said openly, well, now I feel like my glasses are on. Now I feel like I have glasses on. I thought, thought that I could see, but now my glasses are on and I can see definition and color and hues and I can see the fine lines that I was missing before. So I let everybody kind of be like, yeah, that's how I feel. I have my glasses on. Well, let me share with you. In the third grade, I was told that I need to wear glasses. My mom got me Steve Urkel glasses, guys. <laughs> I looked ridiculous. Like, rid like I mean, sir, like, it was ridiculous. I know my sister and my dad are on. Y'all did me dirty. I looked crazy. Crazy. So I'm sitting in class, and when I got made fun of, when it became uncomfortable, when I was tired of being picked on, you know what I did? I took my glasses off. And I didn't see as clear. So I'm asking you, if you are one of the amazing people that say, now I have glasses on and I can see, now don't take them off, even when it's hard. Now don't take them off, even when it's uncomfortable. Now don't take them off when they're not popular. 
you won't always be popular standing up for stuff like this. You will lose family. You will lose friends. And that is a very hard place to be, but it is the truth. So I just wanted to share that with you. Keep those glasses on at all times, not just when it's the popular thing to do. Because yeah, many of you posted your black square, but in six months from now, I wanna go to your account and I wanna see if you're talking about what you talked about on June 2nd. I wanna see a year from now in 2021, if you're still talking about this issue. Because then if you're not, I know you took your glasses off and it hurts my heart. So now, um, as two women expressed uh, being in an interracial couple, now I kind of want to talk with Lee about raising biracial babies and being biracial women and the, and the, not the product of your guys' relationship, but kind of, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, like, they're not going to make us, but like, they're going to make biracial children. So, okay. <laughs> She's like, you go. Um, so what I shared with you guys earlier you as if you are in our interracial couple or if you know uh, a mixed baby in your life um i had a difficult conversation with my mom and my mom called me and she loves both of those girls and she was like upset she's like mari why didn't you tell me why didn't you tell me that you had to deal with this why didn't you tell me that i need to be more aware when i have the girls why don't why didn't you tell me that you like you would say some things but you never said anything and I said, mom, and I brought up a conversation. So Tori first moved from Iowa and came to um, Arizona and she didn't have any family. So I asked my mom, I said, hey mom, is it okay that Tori um, brings her and her fiance and en enjoys Thanksgiving dinner because she doesn't have any family? My mom didn't think anything of it because she would say, I don't see color. I've educated her on how she can't say that. But John was like, hey, is this Mariah's black family or is this Mariah's <laughs> white family? Which one is it? Like it's a conversation that needed to be had. But a lot of people don't realize why it's being said. And me and Tori talked about it. And she's like, I didn't think anything of it. And I'm like, I know why he asked me that. So it's like understanding that you might have mixed friends. You might have black friends. You might have white friends. And making sure that you understand what is and what is not okay. I'm just going to, you guys are going to laugh and you're going to think it's funny. But me and Jen have had multiple conversations. Don't touch people's hair. Just don't touch people's hair in general. Just don't do it. Just, just don't do it. There's a lot of women that will be like, and I've given safety to Virginia to ask questions and, and feel safe with me. And she'll see a mixed girl and be like, you know, is she mixed? Is she not? Her hair's different than yours. Is that? Like, and I allow her to ask questions. There's times where I'm like, Jen, Lord have mercy. I'm praying for you. But I give her the space because she doesn't know what she doesn't know. Right? Like even just looking at me and Lee and Alex, Alex has beautiful braids in your hair. You will not see me ever walk around with braids. <laughs> there you go. You will never see me walk around, <laughs> walk around with braids in my hair. But that doesn't mean that my hair is a weave. I've had multiple women be like, you know, is your, is your, I just saw your hair curly. Like, did you, did you cut your hair? Is that a weave? Is that fake? Is that extensions? Can I touch it? Can I pull it and make sure it doesn't come out? Like, these are questions that are asked. I'm asking you not to ask the questions unless you're in a safe place to ask the question, honestly. But I, you don't know what you don't know. But don't, don't ignorantly go into a room of strangers and just be like, so is your hair real or is it a weave? Like, don't do stuff like that, right? And as a biracial woman, I understand and I want you to understand as, a, as, as people who might be interacting with biracial women, it's hard for us to feel like we fit. Because like Lee was talking about my doctorate, I wanted to be white. And me and her have had these really hard conversations within our house of she's been talking about this since we've met. met, since we've met. And I've always been like, oh my God, here she goes again. I don't want to talk about this. Like, I don't want to. And then I would just be like, oh, here we go. Like, and she has these wonderful shirts with like Rosa Parks on and all this other stuff. And our five-year-old had asked the question about it yesterday because she was wearing it. And I'm sitting there like, now I get what you're saying, but this is the thing. I was on the spectrum of, I was just trying to be white. I just wanted to fit in where I was welcomed. 
I wanted to fit in, like I didn't have to prove myself. And I'm going to be honest with those of you who are in the black um, Beachbody page and many white people are going to be like, what? There's a page? Yeah, there's a page <laughs> within Beachbody where it's nothing but black women and Beachbody coaches. I'm going to let you know right now in the last three days I've been posting in that page and I have been more afraid to post in that page than I was to send Kim Fitzpatrick or Melanie Mitchell or Amy Silverman this invite. I was more afraid to post in that page than anything else, but that's my own internal issues. I know that about myself. Where Lee would be like, that's the first place, place I would post that. Like, let's, let's go, let's cheer each other on. Tangie's like throwing her head. Like, that's a place where it would just be like, we would feel united. Where I'm like, crap, like, am I welcome? Like, am I black enough? Do I fit in enough? This is for, like, this was in the last three days, guys. This is an everyday issue. So as a biracial woman, understand we have different struggles where Alex is like kind of on the spectrum where she says, you know, I was comfortable being more around white women because like that's how I adapted, but she still felt comfortable. I, I'm saying the same thing as a biracial woman. We just come at it from very different angles and just being aware that some people can feel not black enough or not white enough, but really it's just at the end of the day, do you bleed red? Are you a human being? Is this about equality? Yeah, we have different hair. I know that I'm going to be at Jen's house and Tori's house when they have their babies and I'm going to help them learn how to do their hair. That is just a normal thing. It's just, it's just what's gonna happen, right? But I also want you guys to understand that this is about unity and equality. I could talk on forever. You, what do you have to say as a biracial woman? Um, well, I just think it's interesting when she asked me to come on as a biracial woman, because it's been probably 30 years since I've identified as that. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I was rejected by the white side, family included. I don't even call them family, they were relatives. We share a little bit of DNA. And my black side of the family was never an issue. Um, I did to some of the, um, the light skin jokes on the black my, in my community. Um, but I was never rejected. Um, so I grew up identifying as black. Um, that's just, that's, it is what it is. Um, I think what it comes down to now, we're getting more into the nitpicky. What are you, what are you, what are you? Um, because we are living in such a divisive political climate in our nation that, we have to say where we stand on something in order to figure out which group we're supposed to go in. Um, so I think the purpose of this conversation, the perfect purpose of anything that's related to this movement is that now is a time um, regardless um, of, of what you're identifying as, regardless to the experiences you've had or not had, we're looking at the, the, divisiveness and the, the situation that's going on. George Floyd is one of so many situations that have taken place. It's interesting to see things have changed since the 60s. So now you've got a lot, a lot of people of different colors going out there and protesting. They are appalled. But you have to understand, this is one that was actually caught on video. What I need everyone to understand is, is that this happens to us every day. And so, you know, I think the difference um, with how we're raising kids compared to how I was raised, you were raised different than I was raised, is that we need to support them. We need to answer difficult questions. We need to have uncomfortable conversations and we need to educate our kids, no matter what color they are, the history of the black community so that we can be not just sensitive and accepting. I don't want you to accept me. I just want you to know who I am and what's going on in the world. So um, my hope is that everyone um, takes the time to educate themselves, educate your kids, expose them to uncomfortable things because guess what? You shelter them, they're in for a, a big surprise when they get older, a big surprise. If you are keeping your kids from what going, what's going on because you even have that choice, that's an issue. That is a huge issue. Because it's my civic duty to, 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 to try to help all my neighbors. 
And if you're going through it, I'm going through it. So I, um, I hope that the takeaway is that. Um, and then that's just, all I got to say. Yeah. Really. And being proactive and understanding that, um, and it, we touched on it a little bit, having a biracial daughter versus a biracial son there's a mm -hmm. difference in how things need to be said. There's a difference mm -hmm. in how they need to go about things. And I know before we got on the call, mm -hmm. Lee had asked Tori in Virginia mm -hmm. about um, kind of empowering her black sons and godsons. Do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, so I mentor a lot of kids. I have kids that call me mom um, more than they talk to their own biological mothers. Um, I have a lot of young black men that I have mentored and, you know, um, what the school that I the schools that I have taught in, um, my kids are called thugs. It's a last stop school for the kids that have gotten kicked out of other schools, or they that's just that's just all they have left. Um, I've had these quote unquote big black thugs come in my room bawling their eyes out because of the experiences that they have. I come into school sometimes on a Monday, hoping that nobody got shot over the weekend. Um, my boys have told me about being slammed on the concrete by police officers. Um, one of my young men, he said that he was gonna go to Scottsdale, which again, he was gonna go and take a, go on a date with a white girl. And my conversation with him was, okay, so now if y'all get pulled over, please tell her to be quiet and just sit there. Because if she starts popping off, but then again, if she's too quiet, you know, they might think that you're doing something to her. Matter of fact, I want you to call 911 if you get called, pulled over and let them know that you're being pulled over and where you are. And, and, you know, push record on your phone because I don't want anything. Don't reach for anything. Just keep your hands on the steering wheel. Say yes, officer, no officer. And if she starts talking about, I want to see your badge and we're going on and on and on. And I have to prepare him for this. And he's like, miss, you tripping. Am I? And um, some of you may never, ever have to have that conversation with your son. Um, and me growing up in the 80s and, and, and 90s and, and going through the racism that I went through, I worked so hard to get a college education. I worked so hard because as parents, we all want better for our, our kids. And here I am with a five-year-old having to prepare her for everything that I went through 30 years ago. This will not stop unless we have support because the difference between now and then, no one supported me. And it's not that only the white voice matters, it's just that the oppressed voice is very seldom heard. So please join in unity. You don't have to be a savior. You just have to be somebody that locks in arms and say, hey, we're going to get through this together, whatever it is that we got to go through. So, yeah. <clears throat> so that's very powerful. I see a lot of amazing Black women. Thank you so much for sharing this, that you are a Black mother raising Black men, raising Black males within this, uh, this time. And it's just super hard and hard to kind of wrap your head around. Um, I hope that this was helpful and eye-opening. Um, Alex, do you still want to touch on healthcare? Do you want to open up for Q&A? Um, I actually wanted to talk more about Beachbody. Oh, yeah. That, I think that that's a great segue. Um, we are going to kind of, if everybody, all the speakers are okay with that, we're, we were just going to go into the last piece. Yeah? Okay. So the last piece, and Alex, you can start it, is we want to help you move forward in life unlearn and learn, move forward, but also as coaches, predominantly Beachbody coaches on this call. Otherwise, if you're a blogger, entrepreneur, influencer, what have you, we want to share some tips on how to move forward successfully in your business. So Alex, go ahead and take it away. Um, so I actually, so I do want to touch a little bit more on my experience because I know most of you guys are Beachbody coaches on here and I want you to understand even within our company, the things that I feel that I know other minorities in Beachbody feel. Um, I touched on when I went to my first summit, I had no idea what I was going to experience. I honestly had, didn't even think I was going to work the business. But when I went, I loved our culture. I loved that we, how Beachbody treats us. Um, I love the recognition. I love all of the things, but I can't help 
not mentioning that when I looked across the huge stadium, I, it, I could barely see any black people. When I looked down into all the elite, the premier one, is that one I see down there? You have to realize that when, when people become a part of something, if they don't see someone who's up there who looks like them, they don't feel like they can do it. I've come from a place where I have always been around white people. So I've always been like, well, I got to do it. I got to be the change. I got to be the person who's going to be that for other people. So when I came into Beachbody, in my head, it was a question. Do I want to do this fight? Do I want to have this fight? I believe in the mission. And I believe that this has the power to transform lives. But do I, do, really, God, do I have to do this again? Do I have to do this again? Can I do this? Is it possible? You know, last summit, I remember Artina being on stage, first Black person I've ever seen in any type of capacity speaking on a stage at Beachbody. And she mentioned something about, you know, a Black woman. And I'm sitting there with my entire white team. And I'm like, yeah, like, and I felt uncomfortable being like, yeah, because no, none of the white girls around me were saying, yeah. You know, like, I, 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 decided to take this on and you guys have to understand part of the reason why I decided to not just be a coach but to become a star diamond coach to become an elite coach to push myself I'm a full-time pharmacist it is hard as hell to work this business with a full-time job I pl applaud all of you guys who are doing it it is not easy and for me part of what pushes me each day is because I'm like dang like I love Beachbody. I love what we stand for. But if the people we're helping look anything like our organization looks, which it does, let's not play. If our organization looks like the people that we are helping, we have a problem. Period. I don't care about how good our mission statement is. We have an issue. And it's like, I realize that part, what I'm putting on myself is to become one of those people up there who some, uh, someone else who looks like me, who looks Asian, who looks Indian can be like, oh, there's some diversity up at the top. You know, like, oh, it is possible for me to get up there. She did it. And I want my team to be a reflection of what I believe that this company should look like. That photo of 20,000, 30,000 coaches working out outside. What does that photo look like to you guys? Our mission and what Carl is pushing for is to reach the world, is to go into every single country. And we have Beachbody On Demand streaming on every single TV in any capacity possible in this nation, in this whole world. That will not happen if Beachbody looks the way it does, continuing in the next years to come. I promise you, it's not gonna be successful. What happens when we go to Asia? How many Asian coaches do you guys know? It's not going to happen, period. So. What I implore you guys to do is, once again, reflection, self-reflection, but then also be in that fight with me because I don't have a voice. I feel like I don't have a voice in this company until you reach a certain level. So that's why I'm working my ass off to finally reach five star. I don't know. I asked Jen the other day, you know, how many coaches are in those elite things? Like, you know, like when you go and you guys get celebrated in, in Phoenix, this this fall like how many black coaches are there and she's not someone who sees like that but i i'm pretty sure our team is the only one like that's mind-blowing to me you guys so therefore i've put on myself to get a seat at that table so that i can even create a voice for the average black girl because i can promise you right now the average black girl does not see this opportunity as something that she wants to be a part of that she can succeed in the average black girl. I'm not talking about the, the superstars or like people with these huge fitness accounts. The average black girl does not see a place here. And I'm someone who's been amongst in the predominantly white field, so I can find a place here, but I want for everyone to be able to see a place here. And it's hard for me even talking to fellow black girls because when they look at my materials, <laughs> I'm with all white girls and it's like, okay, well, like, does she like white people more than black? No, it's just, I have to force my way into this space. And it shouldn't be like that. I shouldn't have to force myself into this space. And then hopefully my voice can reach the right black girls who have been in the situation as me. And they listen to my mission and my vision for our team and how I want it to be super diverse. And I want more black girls in Beachbody in general. And they feel like having that fight because it's a fight.
and not every, the average black girl is wanting to have that fight again. So we have work to do. And I, I know it's gonna have to come corporate down and I hope that they amplify the black voices in Beachbody because you guys, just like there's money put into things to reach different cultures and companies when they're trying to get more diverse, there's money that needs to be shifted in the company to reach these communities of people that don't look like everybody else. Because I promise you this mission of reaching the world, there's no other way it's going to happen unless Beachbody starts to look like the world. Amen. And then Alex, that was powerful. She was giving me chills. I was seeing everybody talk about national wake up call. Yes, yes, yes. There's a reason why we were talking and we shared in this. And then I just want to come at it as you guys said, congratulations to being a five-star qual next week. We will, my team, I love my team. will be a five-star team. Do you guys even know my name before this call? Did you know who I was? Do you know that I've been a two-time premier team? Do you know that? That's the problem. That's what, share, that's what Alex is talking about. And just like along with Alex, it was as soon as our Tina was up there, he was like, yes, yes. Like, and I'm screaming. And Alex was surrounded by white coaches, but I had three women of color with me who were all like, yes, yes, yes. And I look at them and I said, we will get there. And now I want to share with you, I've been at that table. It's a table that I don't really like it's a table that I still am not accepted at. And I want that to change. So if I could take Alex's talk and saying, yes, we need to get there, but then amplify a step further, I have earned a seat at the table. And this past Wednesday, I wasn't acknowledged at that table. I did earn a seat to have premiere on my wall. I did earn a seat for two times. I've been a full-time nurse practitioner and I have hit these huge milestones. And now walking into Five Star, I'm telling my team, like, I'm going to be at leadership and I'm going to talk and I'm going to do this and I'm going to stand up. And I remember speaking at an event at Summit and I was in front of everyone knowing that I was the only black woman speaking, but I knew that it wasn't until my white counterparts came behind me and validated what I said until somebody trusted what I said. And I'm saying with Alex along with ringing ears is we need to change that. Would I be happy? I don't know. Have, have we ever had a black person speak on the national wake up call? Please let Alex be the first one. Have we? I think the answer is no. Why? That's what we're talking about. So she's right. When we go to Asia, Australia, Italy, like nobody's going to see that they can truly do it. So we need to speak. We need, okay. Artina has. So thank you, Jen. So one, how many coaches are there? 450,000, last I checked. We need to speak in unison that we need more diversity. We need people on our team that are diverse and we need a place where we can offer inclusion. 100%. Jen, Tori, is there anything that you wanna add, Lee? Anything you wanna add um, in terms of moving forward? I would just say invite, um, invite the human. Send your invites in order to talk to humans speak light into humans. A lot of people are trying to navigate their social media like, well, do I talk about this? Do I not? Am I insensitive? Am I bit, like all of these things where you kind of just feel like you're on eggshells. I don't want you to be on eggshells. I want you to stand for what you believe, shed light and difficult conversations. But then when you are in your inbox and you're in your DMs, actually ask the question, how are you? And be ready to respond and hear what they're really feeling. I've been doing that all week. I'm at Success Club 10. My business is still going. I'm still inviting, but I'm asking the hard question. How are you? I'm not doing so good. Okay, neither am I. It's really hard. I went from hurt to anger to frustration, and now I'm empowering. I want you to be on this call on Saturday, but I want you to be a part of this community, this community of inclusion. I want you to know that you have a place here at the seat at my table and that you are welcome and you are accepted. Are you willing to have that conversation with the people that need it the most? You can still hit success club. You can still move forward. You can still talk about being anti-racist and supporting anti-racism and move forward in this. Tori, Jen, anything you want to add? I think just make an effort to diversify your team. And I feel like actually thinking back on some of our trainings, I feel like that's where the downfall is coming from because a lot of times they're like, what are the five things about you? 
you're looking for people exactly like you. And I think that's something that we definitely need to change because of our mission. We need to reach all people. You want all people to experience this, not just people that are like you. And that's something that, you know, I, I didn't even think of, but going through the trainings, looking back when I was a brand new coach, that's one of the things that they say. So just really be aware of this and make it your mission too. There, there was like 250 people on this call. Make sure it is your mission to bring in people from different cultures and backgrounds, because not only is it going to help us reach even more people, it's going to make your team even better. It's going to make your team be friends with people that they may never have met in their life. And it'll make the world a better place, not just Beachbody. I don't really, I feel like that those are all like great points to end on, but I feel like the only one thing that I would say is these conversations are hard, but if you're not acknowledging it on your social media in some way, some shape or form, like I wrote a post the other day where not, nobody's asking you to have the perfect words, the perfect like story to relate to everything. But if you're not acknowledging it, you're not opening those doors to other people. If you're saying that you want this whole diverse team, you want all of these things, you have to address it and you have to show that you're open, that you have understanding, that you're there to support them. If you're not addressing it, you're not opening that door and you're closing it. And that's the same thing as silence. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for Q&A. The first question that I saw was from Liz. Liz, thank you for dropping that question in there. Alex, I'm going to direct it to you. How do we make sure to address the extra optical obstacles that minorities face when trying to invite? So when it comes to that, you guys, I honestly feel like you, just like Beachbody preaches authenticity, if you truly are someone who wants that diversity, who wants that inclusion, this has to be a part of your narrative, period. If you want other Black girls who can be rock stars in this business to be your friend and to be on your team and for your team to look like that, you got to speak on that. And you have to get in those inboxes of every single person, not just people who look exactly like you and give them the opportunity to know you. Just like we are, we're taught, you know, Follow people, like their stuff, help them get to know you better because then they're going to go to your stories and they're going to learn more about you. They have to feel safe on your team. They have to feel like, oh, I can like, know, and trust her. People who are friends with Virginia, they, they feel that way partly because she has a Black husband, but also, you know, she's just herself and she will speak out when she needs to speak out and a Black person would feel comfortable on her team, right? Um, for me, I feel like, I don't know, I've just been around so many different types of people that I'm easy to relate to, but I also make it a point to not when I'm looking for people to like and follow and start to have conversations with, I literally for anybody and everybody, <laughs> I don't care. Like I'm sending you a message and I might be the first black person who's been in your inbox, but I don't care. And I'm not afraid of that. That's something I know that's part of my mission on my team in general, like my, my mission for my team. So I, I don't have the opportunity to be like, oh, well, she's Asian and she looks like she only hangs out with Asians. And so I feel uncomfortable hopping in her message box and being like, hey, girl, like, we, you, you look like my person. Like, I just stalked your page. Like, hey, like, I, I do that. And it's something that you have to reevaluate your own business and see if you're doing too. Because at the end of the day, it's not about your color. It's about who you are. And you have to be authentically you. And if you haven't been like that, and you don't think that you've been necessarily showing inclusion, and you haven't found anybody who is diverse, it's time to do that. Awesome. Alex, that's wonderful. Um, I saw a question of how we can find the recording. Um, obviously, the leaders of this call uh, will have the recording and post in their team page. I will also post it as a swipe up feature on my personal Instagram. I'm sure uh, Alex Virginia will do the same. So if you're trying to find it, obviously go to one of our Instagrams and we'll, we'll have it there for you. The next question I want to ask, Jillian, I really appreciate your vulnerability in sharing this personal uh, question. Um, I'm going to ask it and direct it towards Lee. She said, how do you approach a racist parent? What do I tell my father and how do I correct him? His comment to this call right now while she's watching was, what are you watching? Propaganda? So <laughs> I, I, I wish I had the 100% correct um, solution for this. 
me personally, all I can say is one, um, lead by example, regardless to whether it's a parent saying something like that, a neighbor, whoever, you have to stand firm in your beliefs. Now you don't have to try to change him because probably I'm guessing your dad's pretty, he's up there and a lot of people like that are not going to change. But all you can do is continue to lead by example so that he can see the type of woman his daughter is. Um, I don't try to force anything down anyone's throat. He has his own beliefs and you're going to have yours. You have to figure out out of those two, which one do you want to stand for? You don't have to, um, you know, sometimes you're going to have to dissociate yourself psychologically from him during certain conversations and then get back because that's your family. But um, again, you know, that's his generation. That's his beliefs. Just stand firm in what you believe in and set that example and stay, stay like a rock for the people that you're trying to support. Also, to add on to that, you guys, sometimes you have to make, you have to be the person who makes that change and make other people feel uncomfortable. Like we're uncomfortable sometimes. Like if I continue to say that in my presence, I, I don't want to be around you that often. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it, it takes you being blatant to friends and family members where it's like, look, if you're going to be talking about that, I'm leaving. They love you. Even if there is, if there's a sliver that they could change their heart, it's going to be on you to make that change because they already love you. They care about you. So therefore, if you're in those situations and you're just, you, you can't just sit back and take it either. Don't just sit there and be like, oh, he's not going to change. So I'm just going to let him talk, whatever he wants to talk. And I'm going to let my kids be around him so they can be infected by that. Absolutely. Or whatever it is. Like make some people feel uncomfortable too. Absolutely. I just, I want to give an example. Um, my grandparents, who I, whom I grew up with, both white, um, they're, they were born in the 20s and they used to say colored when they talked about black people and we're sitting at the dinner table one night I was a teenager and I said can you stop saying that well why that's just how we talk doesn't mean anything I'm not a racist and I had to say okay well, what color am I do I look like you guys and they were like well you know no I said when other people on the street if they said hey colored girl or some other sort of 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 you know, racial appetite, I would have to sit there and be like, that hurts me. So as your child, as your grandchild, does it hurt you to see me hurt? And they said, yes. I said, then please stop using that term. So I think like, if you can find a way to let those people feel it from where they're sitting, then maybe it'll help them experience some sort of empathy. But Alex, you're absolutely right, because sometimes we have to make a choice. Who are we, who do we really want in our lives that often? Who are we really going to raise our children around? So, yeah, yeah. Um, Virginia, that's a great point, both of you. I appreciate you. Um, Virginia, I'm going to ask you this question from Ashley. Again, thank you so much for feeling safe enough to ask the question. I've seen some of my Black friends saying that they are tired of people messaging them and asking how they're doing, which I totally understand. So how do I approach my black friends when I really do care about them and want to ask how them they are doing during this time? I feel like that's tough coming from me, but I feel like still say something because if you don't say anything, then they have no idea where you stand. Even if it's just a message saying thinking of you or FaceTime them and be able to talk to them face to face so that they can see you and see that, you know, you know that they're hurting. So it's, it, your heart is hurting for them too. Um, I think that's the best advice. You know, I've reached out to all my friends and just said, thinking of you right now, I know it's hard and my heart hurts for you. And that's, that's what I've been saying. I don't know. I feel like you guys could say something back as well, because I don't know on the other standpoint, you know, how that's being received. But overall, my friends have all been super, you know, happy that I've reached out and said something and made the effort to acknowledge that, you know, right now is hard. Yeah, and I guess I'll chime in. It's crazy because Rebecca, um, she said some of the most impactful messages I've received is I'm here, your life matters. Well, I have a podcast called Your Life Matters. So I talked about unsettling times like this. I share this episode. And for me, honestly, if I'm being completely honest, being on this side of it, my friends who haven't reached out to me, it's more hurtful. My friends who haven't posted about it, it's hurtful. The leaders that I surround myself who haven't talked about it, and I took time to be hurt and angry and then sit back and be like, okay, ask. 
I know this person's heart. I know this person's character. Now I'm going to ask you, why didn't you say anything? Please help me understand. Please help me understand why you didn't address me. Please help me understand why you didn't talk to me. So then I'm going to obviously wait for their response and then proceed the way that I need to. But I think a lot of us who are on the other side and Alex can speak differently, me not receiving a message and you not acknowledging what's going on is you being silent, is you not caring. And whether you say, well, you're, you're one of my good friends and you're black, so I'm not a racist. <laughs> you don't get a pass from me. You don't get a pass from me because you're not saying anything. Because you're not saying anything hurts more. So I would just say, I would keep sending the message and just be like, you know, if, if somebody does the one-off time or like, stop asking that question, that's okay. But they at least know that when it came down to it and this hard time was happening, you did check on them. And I'll chime in there too, just to have like another, just to get your wheels turning. Um, and obviously this is not the same, but think of when you're younger and you learned of learning. So say your friend has purple hair and somebody is picking on them and you just stand there. You don't say anything. You never check in with them. You're never like, I'm sorry that happened. They're so mean. Like think of it in that way too. And you would reach out, you know, most people would say, I'm sorry that happened or acknowledge some kind of way. So just think about it in that way too. Yeah. And also for me, um, I appreciate messages of people telling me, you know, I'm standing by you. I, you know, I'm so sorry about the stuff that's going on. Thank you for shedding light on different situations. I haven't even really talked on my Instagram stories about my experiences because you guys have to understand we've been going through this for years and it's not like I, it's not fun for me to reflect on those parts of my life. It's not fun for me to experience it today. And so I appreciate the messages to know you're standing by me. But then when people ask questions about what they can do, it's like, I also have to protect my energy. I also have to protect my spirit, my soul. So I can't necessarily respond to every single message telling you what you can do. Like, it, you have to do that yourself, but just, just let me know that you're standing by me. I have a ton of messages that I haven't responded to yet and I'm getting to them, but I, I had to protect my own energy and make sure I'm not draining myself, trying to help people who haven't don't understand me and don't understand my plight. But I also recognize that I do have a mission as a human being to let my voice be heard. And so I'm working on that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so it's funny, Virginia had said, uh, sent me a message last night and was like, can somebody please talk about this? And I was like, yeah, you. And me and Lee were both talking about it. And we're like, you talk about it. And I thought I would just say it, but also Allie, thank you for your vulnerability. You touched on it right away. She said, I was listening to today's top hits on Spotify on Thursday while walking and song after song had the N word in it multiple times. And we talked about black and and talked about black people from black song writers. It's confusing why this is still acceptable and published. So, Jen, do you want to open up the forum for what your response would be to that? Okay, number one, it is never acceptable to say it ever in a sentence. Refer, repeat it when somebody else has said it. Just never, never say it in a song. Never sing it. Just don't say that part. And I watched a really good video because on, to be completely honest, I've had that thought too. Like, why doesn't just everyone not say it? And I watched a really powerful video from an NFL player. I forget his name on the top of my head, but he just said that he said the same thing I said, just never say it, never repeat it. And especially in our business, you guys, we use music, use the clean edited version. I mean, you should, I feel like you should do that anyways with cuss words, just to be respectful. What if a mom's watching this beside her kid and it's just like, F this and we're that like, just, just avoid that. And the reason the NFL player said that, you know, black people can say it or don't even ask the question. They've been oppressed. They've been told what to do their whole life. This is literally one thing that they are able to do that white people can't do. Just leave it. Just don't ask the question. Just it is what it is. And just never, ever say it. It is disrespectful. And if you don't know what it means, Google it so you understand why it is so offensive. And also, you guys have to understand the context. When Black people are saying it to one another, 
you have to realize that that was a derogatory word that was said like in spit, like disgust to us at some point in our history, not too long ago. And the way that Black people can flip that and make it they've turned it into a term of endearment towards one another. Like everyone else around us are spitting it at us like this is an ugly word. So guess what? We're going to flip it and we're going to call it to each other as a term of endearment. When you hear us saying it to one another, you, you usually hear it as a term of an endearment, but it's not to be construed as like we're, we're saying it negatively towards one another, unless it's like a song where someone's like, be whatever. Like, you know, there's those situations, but when you hear black people say my n word they're saying is it like you're you're it's a term of endearment but it's not it's just not acceptable for people of other races to call it to us you know what i mean like it's just historically a derogatory very derogatory word and so it just yeah what jen said yeah yeah thank you for adding that um this last question um, that I see right now, uh, Tori, if you want to touch on this, I have a very, Michelle, thank you. I have a very empathetic child who feels de deeply to others' pain and causes a lot of anxiety for her. She has been struggling so much because she loves deeply like me. How much do you share with her without making her anxiety become damaging? Um, when she doesn't understand the hate in the world, what approach do you take? My daughter has the biggest heart and has, bu has bullied a I'm assuming has been bullied a lot or already in her age. The first thing that came to mind was limit her exposure of how much, but you have to have those conversations of she asked, how old is she? How old did you say? I think you're Michelle. I can see you. You can pull up your number. You can meet. She's nine. Nine. So definitely have those conversations. I would ask her specifically starting out, how does she feel? How does she feel about this? What does she know? And get her stance on it and then have the conversation with her. We've had some deep conversations um, a lot lately. Yeah. What's her, like, what does she think and how does she feel? Doesn't understand why people would not love everybody. Like, just doesn't get it. Like more of the confusion side of it? Yeah. Well, we live in a really not very diverse area at all so and just the whole idea of unlearning and I'm just giving her the understanding that I'm learning yeah. I would just keep reassuring her then and keep sharing those experiences thank you yeah I think that's great. Tori, thank you for um, chiming in. I, my, my friend Jen um, is asking a question about protecting your um, personal space and your peace and your, and your time and, and just your energy. And I think that's a great question that I'm going to answer is it is okay to not be okay. It is okay to walk away and it is okay. Your business will survive if you don't post for a day or two or a week. Um, my dear friend, Kate Schultz is doing a fantastic job of amplifying myelinated voices. And right now on her social media, as I wanna say the last time I checked, she was number seven in the company. She is sharing resources. She is talking with me multiple, we talk almost every day and we have uh, safe conversations, but she's sharing and she's saying that right now, yes, this is her income, her full-time income for her and her husband as a retired police officer. And right now she is sharing loudly what matters because this is bigger than Beachbody. This is bigger than anything else. We need to be talking about that. So I would say provide yourself with resources, but it's okay to walk away. There was times when I was sharing with her, I was overwhelmed, I had headache, I didn't feel good. I put my phone away and I just laid down. I took a nap. I stopped answering, responding to text messages and phone calls because I didn't want to talk about it. And I prayed. I expressed my anger, my frustration in safe places. And then I was like, bless and release. What can I do with this? I can empower, I can inspire, I can come together. Like as soon as I was starting to get riled up, I called Jen, I called Tori, I called Alex, I talked to Leah. I said, we need to do this. I'm a person of action. So protect your energy, but then figure out why you're feeling what you are. I feel like meditation is really good. Working out, getting, pressing play and encouraging other people to press play, drinking your daily superfoods if it, if it allows you, if you don't have some type of health condition or medication. Um, and then making sure that you are acting after you had that time to process. If you like candles, incense, sage, whatever it is that 
allows you to feel good. Maybe it's just putting your phone on airplane mode and do not disturb and walking outside. Obviously, uh, Arizona is 116 degrees and not walking outside, but walking outside, getting some fresh air and just being calm. Maybe you don't listen to a podcast where other people are pouring into you. Maybe you don't listen to music that could potentially distract your thought process. Maybe you listen to piano chill music. Maybe you are just silent. Maybe you're listening to Zen yoga music while you're walking. Just really decompress and just figure out kind of where you are, if that makes sense. Um, Dorian had asked, Mariah, you mentioned leaders not reaching out or even acknowledging the issue. How does one handle that? Um, I will touch on it and then Jen, Alex, Tori, feel free. Um, I... Personally, as someone who experienced this this past week, I needed to go through the stages of grieving. I needed to be hurt and sad and cry and remove myself. I needed to reach out to my dear friend, Jen, who's on that same team and ask questions and see if I was alone in my feelings. Then I, need to, I needed to get very effing angry. And then I needed to be quiet. And I needed to go through those stages. And once I was quiet, I had to come at it from two different sides and two different perspectives. Because what I have been using as an analogy for a lot of my friends is Black people have been going through this for 401 years. This is a wound that has been there and people constantly are ripping over the scab. For my white friends on this call, your wound was just made on Tuesday. Hmm. Your wound was just made on Tuesday and now you are feeling it. I am not going to, I apologize that you are hurting, but I am not sorry. And I say that with respect because I need you to feel it. I need you to be hurt. I need you to cry. I need you to get angry. And then I need you to take time to be quiet. And then I need you to act, not today, not tomorrow, not a year from now for the rest of your life. So that is the difference. So how did I handle it? I went through all the stages and when I was quiet, I came to her and I asked the question, because I want to understand. After the response is going to be given to me, then I'll go from there. But I ask the questions because I'm brave enough to. I am brave enough to make somebody else feel uncomfortable. And I'm brave enough to say, you hurt my feelings. And this is why. So I would say handle it and handle it head on. Um, Alex, if there's anything, Jen, Tori, if you want to say anything to that. Yeah, um, I think everybody processes differently. I wasn't someone who watched that and then was able to just like do say all the things on social media post all the things like I felt a deep generational pain it's not it's not even like a simple oh my god I can't believe this happened like this is something so deep that I I can't even it's hard to express it, you guys. Like, this is something my ancestors has been through. I'm not someone who's like, oh, I'm Caribbean. Like, I'm not, I don't know my culture. So therefore, that's how I know that I'm from the slavery times. Like, my ancestors are from that. We lost our culture. I don't know if I'm from the Caribbean. I don't know if I'm African. I don't know where I'm from. My grandparents, two of them, super light-skinned, like super light-skinned, probably could have passed back in the day. The other two, and they're both married to one another, light-skinned, dark-skinned, super dark-skinned. That's why I'm the brown I am. My parents are as well. And this, this pain that I feel, it's deeper than just what a lot of people are experiencing. It's, it's not from just me. I can feel that it's deeper than that. So um, just go through your process. But find a way that you are going to contribute, choose your lane and go hard in that lane, go hard in that lane. Like I can choose to like go out and do protests and stuff like that, but I'm not in that position right now. I work in the military, you know, like I'm a part of the uniform services and I'm an essential worker. So I'm not able to present myself in those cities. I live in a remote area. I came to serve the Native Americans because I recognize their plight in this country and I wanted to learn more about them. So I've been serving their communities for the past going on four years now. And so the only way that I can raise my voice and what I'm coming to, what I've came to by the end of this week is by promoting this and by promoting my health and by promoting other people to stay 
good. Like make sure you're moving your bodies, make sure you're, you know, like eating good, take care of yourselves. But it's hard for me to say that to the black community when they don't see themselves reflected in what I'm trying to do. So I just recognize that I have a big fight ahead of me. And it's so crazy that, you know, I don't know if a lot of you guys know, but I'm doing insanity right now. And when I chose to do this a month ago, I had no idea that these events were going to happen. But I told myself, I was like, you're about to be in the fight of your life. And in my head, I'm about to be in the fight of my life to raise my business up to five stars so I can leave my job at the end of the year. No, 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 no. I right now am in the fight of my life. And I had no idea it was going to deal with racial issues and stuff like that. So I just encourage you guys to, out of all the resources you find and things that you can do, choose one and commit to that. When you feel like you got that, choose another one. How can I advance it even more? What can I donate to now? Wait until you can afford to donate, but you got to pick a lane and just commit to it for life. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I'm going to finish the call. Thank you so much for all of your time. I'm going to finish the call with two last questions and then statements from every one of the speakers. Um, the question is from my dear friend, Amanda, about division within leadership. Um, I'm going to come at it from a stance of a leader who is black. And then I would like maybe Virginia or Tori to come at it from a stance as a leader who is white. Um, my stance is very simple. You can't use me as your black token friend is what I saw in the comments. You can't use me as your proofreader. You can't use me as well. My, my upline is black. You can't say any of those things in it matter to me. What I want is you to be an ally and anti-racism. What I want is you to be an ally with me in this fight that, uh, like Alex said, is a fight that we have been dealing with for all of our life. So my statement is simple. If you are not for me, I will try to understand where you're coming from, but at the end of the day, you are against me. I will not serve as a mediator between you and the other white coaches on our team. I will express to you my viewpoint and how I feel. But at the end of the day, if you are bullying any of my black coaches, if you don't stand with me, you will, on my stance, not be welcome. And I say that not in a way of being crappy, but I know that there was a coach that was actually outwardly talking about racist things on her social media and members of the black which is the organization of black colored women and beachbody reported it compliance canceled her account and she is no longer with us nor is she ever going to be allowed to be with us and that is corporate compliance's stance on racism and bullying so my stance is aligned with them if you are on my team and you are bullying or you don't agree with me, you are not welcome on my team. And I will try to have an open conversation conversation with you. I will try to allow a safe space. But after that conversation is over and we don't agree, uh, you are not going to lash out your racist, racist remarks or hatred towards anyone within my team, because just like Alex and the rest of the speakers have said, it is about unity, inclusion, solidarity, peace, and that is not welcome. So that's my take on it. Virginia, if you have anything that you want to add as a leader, how you would be? So I think for a lot of people, it's hard right now, which I get, but just say something, do something. And I know even for myself, and I feel like, you know, I have been through situations where this has come up before, so it's not my first time. If it is your first time dealing or being exposed, just say something. It may not be the right thing. It, and, and also have, if somebody corrects you, be thankful that they reached out to correct you. you know, I've seen a lot of people using the hashtag all lives matter and i'll be honest when this first black lives matter hashtag came out i think i put both because i just didn't know i didn't understand i thought you know everybody gets where i'm coming from right all lives matter of course black lives matter right now but when you're using that hashtag it comes off as you're being insensitive and you know you've seen the tiktok videos and they've done such a good job of showing why you shouldn't use that hashtag right now and why black lives matter matters is the issue at hand and i encourage you guys to dive in and when you learn something share it on your stories because if you're learning it chances are a lot of your followers probably 
and I hope that they're just naive or they just don't know. And hopefully this is a way you can educate them. So I know it's, it's challenging. It's been even challenging for me too, because in the past, my husband's like, well, why now are you like Black Lives Matter? And I'm coming from the standpoint that, you know, I've learned so much and I want other people to learn and be able to join this movement and understand why it's so important. So that's kind of my standpoint in this. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful takeaway. Um, and just being able to speak to that as leaders, um, every single one of you are leaders and that's kind of how I wanna end it. Every single one of you have the ability, black leaders, white leaders, Mexican leaders, whatever, you are a leader. You were given this life, you were given this breath. And I always say this, and those of you who listen to my podcast, I say you're wanted, you're needed, you're worthy, you're loved, and you're more than enough. And that goes for every single human being on this earth. So what we, and I'm speaking for the unanimous speakers on this call, what we want you to take away from this is how to talk to your kids and help to empower them to be the next generation that dismantles racism and moves our world in a positive, more diverse and unified way. We ask that you understand that this isn't just a U.S. issue, that it, this is a world issue. I want you to understand that as leaders, it is hard if you are in a multiracial couple or you are biracial or you are a healthcare provider like Alex and I, you are an essential worker. Whatever the case is, this is something that is being done and seen everywhere you go. And we just are asking you to do better, be better, act, and do not sit in silence because if I see you guys in, in Summit, I know this year it's virtual. If I see you guys at leadership, I want you to feel comfortable coming up to me and giving me a hug. I want you to feel comfortable going up to Alex and Tori and Virginia and every human being in that room and feel comfortable like you are safe and you are wanted and you are included. That's the difference. And that's what we want you to get from this call. So there was, two, there was almost 300 people at one point on this call. We will share the recording. Um, with everyone who wants to hear it, please. I know that we are going to get an influx of questions and comments in each of our inboxes specifically. Please understand that we have a lot of messages. We will get back to them. Um, continue to share, continue to grow, be better, do better. Um, Alex, Tori, Lee, uh, uh, Virginia, is there anything that you want to say before I end the recording and allow you guys to go on with your Saturday? Yes. Uh, and I appreciate you guys for hopping on it means a lot and um yeah don't hesitate to reach out to me um I will show love to everyone back and I think that this is there's going to be a good thing that comes out of this I think that this is something you know although it's horrible the way it came out and the way that it happened I think that hopefully our generation because our parents generation clearly didn't get it done. But I'm, I'm hopeful for our generation. I'm hopeful that every single one of you guys are gonna be a part of the change. And although when I have kids, I'll have to have the same conversations with them because these things take time. I pray and hope that you guys will just really commit to your generation and the ones after you being different. And yeah, just love you guys. Um, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm pretty new to the beach body um, community. Um, but something that I've noticed um, is that everyone here is all for improving their health, mental, physical. Um, we go to great lengths. All of you, I've seen you guys in your workouts. Some of you have been working out during this multitasking. We push ourselves physically for results. We push ourselves through these insane workouts and struggle and sweat and, and are, you know, I'm not going to make it, but we push through for results. The same thing with what we are ingesting. Oh, I, I see that Chick-fil-A over there, um, but I'm going to go home and I'm going to eat a salad. I'm going to do whatever. And we push ourselves through those cravings, those things for results. In this situation, for those times when you start to feel extremely uncomfortable, Remember what you do to push 
uncomfortable, uncomfortable times as well. This is also a workout for all of us. When we feel uncomfortable, remember that you are capable of pushing through for results. So hopefully we can all continue to encourage each other to push ourselves for results with this as well. Thank you. And I just wanna say thank you guys for showing up. I know a lot of people have been like, what do I do? And I feel like you just being on this call is a step in the right direction. And I talked about this on my stories yesterday. This is gonna be the easy part of me. Mariah, can you mute everyone? What I wanted to say was this is going to be the easy part learning and listening and absorbing, sharing things that are, you know, helping you. What I really want you guys to be able to do is take this into your everyday life. Now apply it. Honestly, sharing on social media about this is easy because you're having all these resources from other people. Now, honestly, for me, I, I'm practicing situations. Like if anyone was to say anything to my husband, what am I going to say? How am I going to stand up? Because for my Enneagram nines out there, I hate confrontation in any situation. When you include race, oh my gosh, this is super uncomfortable, but you have to get uncomfortable and say something, say something. So I, I've been like practicing, what, what would I say in that situation? I can't be the one in shock. He's going to be in shock. He doesn't want to have to stand up for himself. So I'm going to have to say something. And same goes to my friends in situations. What am I going to say? to my friends if somebody says something that I'm not okay with. You just have to, you have to get used to being uncomfortable and calling people out. But thank you guys so much for being on here. I appreciate it so, so much. And I appreciate everybody that came on here and spoke because this was not easy for any of us for different reasons. So I'm glad that we were able to come to you guys today. I feel like there's nothing left to say. Like. This is amazing, and I appreciate everybody getting on. If anybody has questions, or the inboxes are always open. Any thoughts or anything? Alex, is there anything you want to say, or I'm going to kind of wrap it up? Okay, um, so I brought, I'm going to cry. I brought this sweet baby who's very tired, <laughs> but I'll come here out from her playroom. Her sister was entranced in all the videos that she was watching. <laughs> she is 13 months old. Bianca, say hi. She doesn't see color on this screen in the way of anybody gonna hurt her. I need your help to make sure that the world that she goes into loves her and sees her for the happy baby that she is and the wonderful human that she is. So I'm asking you to be better, to do better, to act and not be silent. And if you can't do that for me or Lee or Tori or Jen or Alex, I'm asking you to do it for her. <laughs> I love you guys so much with all of my heart. And I thank you so much for being honest and open to being on a call at 7 a.m. that lasted almost three hours. <laughs> I am so grateful for every single one of you and you have a special place yeah. in my heart. For any of you who are watching the recording, please message us and know that I love you and you have a special place in my heart. And I want you guys to have a wonderful Saturday. What's up, guys? Thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of the Your Life Matters podcast. I'm so grateful that you're here. I just ask that you share this episode with somebody. I sh ask you to just share it and give it to somebody who could potentially need to hear this message. I really am on a mission to help hundreds of thousands of people to believe that their mess is their message and that their story really does matter and that above all, their life matters. 
I'm so grateful that you're here. I want you to share this episode. And then on top of that, if you could please leave a rating or a review or both, let me know what speaks to you. Let me know what you need to hear. Let me know what you've connected with, because that's going to be the best way that I can make sure that I'm giving you guys exactly what you need. I love you guys with all my heart. I'm so grateful for you. And I want you to know the difference and the impact you guys make in my life. I love seeing your messages. I love seeing when you guys private message me or screenshot it and share it on Instagram or Facebook because it lets me know that this podcast is doing exactly what it was meant to do. And it's to make sure that there's an impact being made and to help remind you and everyone else that your life matters.